Okay, uh, so before we hear from the DOE, I just, I'll ask our council to uh, swear in the administration. If you could just raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and answer council member questions uh, truthfully? Okay, you can just hit the button and state your name for the record and then begin. Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, you may begin. First, I do want to um, acknowledge and show our gratitude for um, Anthony Ramos, who his story is a testament of the greatness within every student and the power of a great teacher like Sarah Steinweiss that truly sees every student to find their passion, purpose, and contribution and unlocks access and opportunity for every student to fully thrive. Thank you, Chair Traeger, for inviting them. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger, and members of the New York City Council Committee on Education here today. My name is Linda Chen, and I serve as the Chief Academic Officer at the Department of Education. I am joined by Alice Brown, our Senior Executive Director for Policy and Evaluation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss the critically important issue of ensuring strong instruction in every New York City classroom that is focused on preparing our students for college and careers. We know that you have called this hearing today due to real concerns about standardized test preparation, and we want to reiterate this administration's focus on a rich, rigorous, joyful and inclusive learning experience for every student. A well-rounded education includes social studies and civics, science, hands-on and project-based learning opportunities, the arts, world languages, physical education, social emotional learning, opportunities to explore and learn from our amazing city and so much more. This is the foundation of our equity and excellence for all agenda, including pre-K for all, 3K for all, universal literacy, computer science, and AP for all, as well as programs focused on college and career readiness. We are deepening this work with the systems approach to improve every classroom in every school, including through the instructional leadership framework, our approach to accelerate learning and instruction in every classroom for every student. Schools across the city have formed or are forming instructional leadership teams, or ILTs, in order to ensure cohesion and rigor in their school's academic approach. ILTs are composed of school leaders, teachers, and staff, and serve as the driving force in the school to improve instructional practices and student outcomes. This is a common sense strategy building, building on this administration's focus on expanding and strengthening professional learning for teachers and building trusting, effective relationships among school staff. Many schools already have ILTs or use a similar approach to instructional leadership and ongoing supports will be offered this year for those teams. ILTs will examine what is happening in classrooms across the school to ensure all students are engaging in rigorous, authentic, and culturally relevant learning experiences. Through the instructional leadership framework, schools focus on one of three instructional priorities, strengthening core instruction, knowing every student well, or using a shared and inclusive curriculum. While I'd be happy to discuss the instructional leadership framework in greater detail, I'd like to speak to one but important part of this approach and the focus of this hearing today. Limited and targeted assessment is a natural part of good instruction. It provides necessary information on the progress students are making toward year-end benchmarks and preparation for future learning. It is important to have multiple stopping points in multiple ways throughout the year for teachers to evaluate where their students are on the learning continuum and what they need to do to continue to help students make progress. There are two primary types of assessments already in use in the New York City schools. First, schools use formative assessments to provide teachers across grades and subjects with information about what students know and are able to do in relation to grade level year-long standards expectations. They can be administered in a variety of ways, paper, pencil, booklets, on the computer, or oral conferencing. Formative assessments are designed to provide data that can be used for teams of teachers to reflect on past instruction and to plan for tailored supports and upcoming instruction for students 
based on their current level of performance. Collaborative inquiry and conversation is a significant component of administering formative assessments. Through data and student work analysis, teams of teachers can reflect on and analyze the implement implementation of their school's curriculum and instruction to assess their effectiveness in providing opportunities for students to develop required grade level skills and determine where gaps in instruction may exist, then allows teachers to plan for adjustments or enhancements to their instruction to address those gaps and ensure students are mastering content. It also provides opportunities for teachers to share the best practices and in instruction and the opportunity to collaboratively reflect on accommodations provided to students with special needs and to make adjustments where necessary, for instance, through conversations between general education teachers and special education teachers. The second form is outcomes-based assessments, which are formal assessments that are given on an annual basis to all students in a grade level or a school. Outcomes-based assessments are an indication of overall achievement levels across a school or district or state. The New York State Education Department requires the DOE to annually administer math and English language arts, or ELA, tests in grades three through eight, science tests in grades four and eight, as well as regents exams in multiple subject areas that are required for graduation in grades nine through 12. The New York State Board of Regents and New York State Education Department also grant some schools a variance to provide a regents diploma without taking all five required regents exams, including 46 high schools that belong to the New York Performance Standards Consortium or the Internationals Network. Like all New York City high schools, these graduates are required to earn 44 distributed credits and pass the regents ELA exam, and for some schools, a math regents exam. These schools instead administer performance-based assessment tasks, sometimes referred to as PBATs, in the other subject areas. The PBATs are written tasks and oral presentations that are reviewed by evaluators external to the school and are graded based on a rubric. Each year, we produce reports to support schools in utilizing the results from outcomes-based assessments to refine their overall instructional planning for the year. The results from the test can also be used as one part, but not the primary part, of promotion decisions as well as certain admissions decisions. New York City and New York State use the results as part of school accountability metrics. In New York City, these exams are included in the School Quality Guide and School Quality Snapshot as only a part of one of seven measures aligned to the framework of great schools, namely student achievement. These family-facing resources are provided to help families understand the quality of their schools and include data from a variety of sources, including formal school visits, feedback from students, teachers, and parents from the New York City School Survey, and a variety of student achievement measures. The new state accountability system is comprised of six measures at the elementary middle level and seven measures at the high school level. At the elementary middle level, four out of six of the measures consider performance on standardized assessments. At the high school level, five out of the seven main measures considers performance on standardized assessments. These measures are used by the state education department to determine which schools are designated as comprehensive support and improvement, or CSI, or targeted support and improvement, or TSI schools. In recent years, we are pleased that the New York State Board of Regents has made improvements to the administration of grades three through eight math and ELA assessments, including shortening the administration from three days to two days, and making these tests untimed so that any student who is productively working will have the time they need to complete the assessment. They have also enacted a moratorium on the required use of these assessments in the evaluations of teachers and principals. We are also closely monitoring the Board of Regents' review of graduation requirements through the Blue Ribbon Commission that will be established later this year. The Commission will be charged with reconsidering current diploma requirements, ensuring all students have access to multiple graduation pathways, and ensuring a transition timeline to allow districts to prepare for and implement any changes. The DOE also offers optional outcomes-based assessments to increase college and career readiness through the AP for All initiative and College Access for All initiative. The AP for All initiative is part of Mayor de Blasio's Equity and Excellence Agenda, 
with the goal that all students will have access to at least five AP classes by fall 2021. In 2018, 55,011 students took an at least one AP exam, a 22% increase since 2016. As part of college access for all, the DOE has provided all juniors with access to the SAT during the school day free of charge. This has led to record high participation. For the class of 2018, 63,499 students took the SAT at least once in four years of high school. This is 80% of the cohort. We remain focused on setting and ensuring a high bar for learning where every student has access to rigorous learning in all content areas and attainment of New York State standards at grade level and beyond. Thank you for your partnership and for the opportunity to testify before you today. We will be happy to answer any questions you have for us. Thank you very much. Uh, just, uh, uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Alika Amber Samuel, Council Member Levin, and I believe uh, that is it. Uh, just, I guess, before I get to my some prepared questions, uh, what is your reaction? I mean, we heard a thank you, which I appreciate. Any reactions to the powerful story shared by both Anthony Ramos and his uh, teacher, Ms. Steinweiss? I have many reactions. Um, one, first of all, in terms of the student focus, there is a greatness that Anthony Ramos represents in every student across this great city. And that greatness is within every student and it is our job as educators in schools across the city to be able to see who every student is, much like Sarah Steinweiss shared, how she sees every student. And that is the role of the Department of Education, to be able to cultivate that kind of professionalism and passion for every one of our students to excel and find what their passion is to be able to equip them with all the skills necessary in order to pursue those passions. So those are just the beginnings of, of my uh, takeaway from there and the idea that there are many ways, multiple measures, many different opportunities to acknowledge and um, represent a student's mastery of learning across a varied uh, level of subject areas and interests. I, I appreciate uh, that, uh, Dr. Chen. If you heard me earlier discuss the irony in his story, because many times when I was teaching, and to this day I still see government documents refer to schools or students as underperforming. Is that term still used to this day, underperforming? I agree with your assertion around that label. Because again, to truly see every student is beyond a label of a single test score. And we stand wanting to ensure that we have multiple ways to view every student and their competencies so that we can also support them where needed. And those kinds of indicators in a variety of ways are important to take notice of. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. I guess th that's maybe your diplomatic way of saying that you hear me, because Anthony is not underperforming. He is quite the talent. Um, and again, the current structure, which I recognize there are a lot of state mandates in place here, but the state has to hear us too. We're the largest city in the state, and we have a big microphone and a big voice. We have to use it. We are not fully capturing the amazing s skills and talents of our students. It's, it's just, we're, we're not capturing it. And I think we, that was a powerful story that I believe many students across our system share. And as you also heard from Ms. Steinweiss, there are educators who just refuse to shortchange their students and shortchange learning. And so we're losing quality educators because of this current structure as well. So this issue is very pressing for a number of reasons. Um, I'll get to some questions. So does the DOE have an estimate of uh, 
how much money does the DOE actually spend on exams, both in terms of purchasing exams, administering exams, and test prep? Is there a ballpark number? So we know that we spend approximately $3 million on regents and uh, grades three through eight ELA and math assessment materials. And in terms of the many things that you listed, some of those things are procured um, individually by schools as well. So I don't have a number in terms of the, the a sum of all of the things that you listed, but I, I do know that we spend about three million on the materials for regents and ELA and math. Right, and I know, for example, we heard in testimony or in other hearings that DOE has a contract with Pearson in terms of asking Pearson to design the specialized exam for high schools. Is that correct? We do have a contract with Pearson. Do you want to answer that for one of the assessments for uh, gifted and talented? Do you want to? Alice can give the details. The about one point nine million dollars is spent for the specialized high school admission test, um, which includes um, some of those funds are not directly to Pearson, but just for the administration in terms of teacher support um, in, and the um, administrative support that goes along with it. Right, so if I heard correctly, like $3 million for Regents, is that right? Regents in three to eight ELA and math materials. Regents in three to eight math ELA, we're hearing about 1.9 million for, and that's just in the last budget, is that correct? That's, that's the size of the whole contract. For the, for the specialized high school admission test, yes. Right, and then there's exams for gifted and talented. I, okay. Do you have an estimate how much that cost? Um, the estimate for the administration is about 4.4 .4 million, which includes um, a, a large percent of that, however, is for the, it doesn't, it is not to the contracted vendor, um, it is for the support of the administration of the test. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but it's fair to say, and, and, and I would appreciate if the DOE can get back to me on the total of all exams that I mentioned in my testimony, just to have a, a full picture of how much, to put a dollar amount to, to this issue, because I think that's important to, to kind of discuss the gravity of, of, of the test culture um, and the cost of the test culture in, in, our, in our school system. Um, and I hear you about there is a place for assessments. I think what we're gonna get at is why are we relying solely on this one area when there are so many other pathways that should be and must be explored to demonstrate student proficiency and mastery. Um, there are, by the way, uh, you mentioned in your testimony, I think a number in the 40s, the council folks have, it. how many consortium schools do we have in New York City's school system? Just so we're clear. I believe it's 40, hold on, I wanna make sure I give you the Because right I'm hearing different numbers, just wanna get a number on the record. There's 38, yeah. our superintendent for consortium so schools. So 38, yeah. it's not in the 40s. There are, there are additional I'm sorry, could you just you could. tell us who you are? Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Alan Chang. I'm the acting superintendent for New York City Consortium Schools, Internationals, and New York City Outward Bound. Um, and so just to clarifying that, that particular number, um, uh, what Dr. Chen mentioned was um, all the schools at the high school level that are either consortium or the internationals who have a slight variance. And so some of our international schools, at those schools the students take both a math and an ELA exam. And then when we're looking at full consortium schools, um, of which there are 38, those schools take um, just the ELA exam. Mm -hmm. And S Superintendent, uh, what, is, what is your background prior to you being in this role? You, you, you oversee the, the consortium portfolio, is that correct? So, so I am a, a high school superintendent with the New York City Department of Education. And prior to this, I was a principal of a consortium school and a teacher in a consortium school. So your, your whole history was in consortium schools? That is correct. So, because I am very 
interested in learning more about this. And I also find it fascinating that this might have been like the best kept secret in the school system because many of my colleagues sometimes don't he have never heard of the consortium network. And my question is why? If there are things that are working, if there are things that are promising, particularly in subgroups, students with IEPs, multilingual learners, why aren't we sharing these best practices? So can you just summarize very quickly for me, because I actually visited, I visited one recently, I'm, I'm visiting more. January is, I think is PBAT season, if I'm not mistaken. I know the terms now, performance <laughs> space, right? Um, tell us quickly your thoughts on what you believe is working um, in consortiums. What is consortium? What do you think is working? And how are we sharing those practices across the system? Sure, um, and, and I really do appreciate you know in, any time on behalf of the schools and the DOE for us to share some really great work that is happening. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, there are there are 38 consortium schools. Um, uh, 27 of them are officially in my district. There are eight transfer schools. Um, uh, there are additionally one school uh, that's a six to 12 in District Seven, and then there are two consortium schools that are in upstate New York. Um, uh, and so, are there any are these all high school, middle school? Or? They're they're all high schools. Um, uh, there are they all culminate in high school. There are a few consortium schools that are grades six through twelve. Nothing elementary. No. Okay. Please yeah. continue. Yep. Um, and so, really, at the heart of the consortium model is this idea of uh, performance assessments. And it's a performance assessment that is really practitioner-developed, student-focused, and really externally assessed. And what I mean by that is that um, teachers are really um, working hard to be able to design the curriculum and the rubrics using a wide variety of resources, um, aligning them to the state standards. Students are engaged in those particular practices and a chance to go much deeper into a particular subject area and express their work. Um, uh, and that is assessed by other teachers that are at the school as well as external evaluators who are brought in um, uh, both on their written work as well as their oral presentations. Um, overall, the, the work of the consortium schools is something that is uh, deeply shared across um, the district. And that, that means principals are collaborating with each other. Uh, in my district, there are additional schools that are not consortium schools. Um, but we're also part of the Affinity Executive Superintendency, which has 162 schools. Uh, so there are many structures that are in place to be able to highlight really great practices in which we invite um, outside officials, uh, outside principals, leaders who want to be able to come and visit and do that work. Um, uh, the consortium also hosts um, an annual conference in which um, uh, members are able to be able to attend, uh, lead professional development workshops, participate, um, and that you know oftentimes has a national presence as well. Um, and I would say that you know the the performance assessments is is one part of what it means to be an excellent consortium school. And really, at the heart of what the department believes is that uh, project-focused instruction, culturally relevant instruction, things that are really grounded in what our students believe and value and want to learn, um, is extremely important. And those things don't only occur in consortium schools, but rather um, uh, we're working hard to ensure that that's occurring really across our system. So, and I, and I really appreciate that response. I, I would just note for you that um, I was elected in 2013, joined the council in 2014. I was very active in my school and in my school community. I did not hear about consortium schools until I joined the council. And this is coming from someone that is very active in education. Um, and I am amazed by what I'm, I, I visited one, I'm visiting more. I have a schedule that's gonna be, uh, I'll be visiting PBAT season, I could tell you that, Superintendent. Good, good. Uh, but I just, I'm trying to figure out if we're, now can you confirm that we're, we're, we're seeing that there are promising results in terms of student proficiency, particularly students uh, with IEPs and multilingual learners? Are, are you seeing that data that we're seeing internally here as well? Uh, th that is correct. I mean, I think there are, there are many different ways for us to be able to measure overall. I mean, I think one of the, the partly because the consortium schools don't take all the exams, the comparisons are a little bit different. But if we're looking at overall graduation rates, um, uh, the graduation rates are, are a little bit higher um, uh, when you're looking across the consortium schools. And they, 
accept all kids. Am I correct on that? Uh, the application process is open to Yeah, all? so the application process um, uh, is open, and, uh, you know, I, I think um, what's important here is that, you know, I think there are, there are hundreds of high schools in New York City, and, you know, I, I know many parents who are looking into the high school process, and it can be hard to find just exactly the right match. Um, and, and as a district, we've really uh, attempted to be able to work with uh, various offices, family welcome centers, to really make sure that these options are well known. Um, because really at the heart of it, the parents and the families really need to understand what this model is about. Because as, as much of a fan as I personally am, because I, I taught in one, I led a school, I was out there being as, as big of a cheerleader as you can be, um, I also know that um, it needs to be the right kind of match. Um, uh, and there are some places and some schools and some particular students for which um, we want to make sure that this is an option that is available um, uh, in which they can apply through the high school admissions process. You hit on something important because in my visit to the school, I visited um, uh, Atward Bound Leaders in my district. Yes. And um, very, very impressed with the visit and, and the talk with, with students. Um, the students shared with me that during freshman year, they had to educate their parents and their families about what the school was doing in terms of assessing their performance. Because PBAT is kind of a new, new term. They're used to hearing either regents or big, big tests. Um, and I think there's more work to do in this area to inform the public about alternative assessments. And for those folks, because I have been waiting for this, for those folks who are saying that any discussion of moving away from high stakes or you know, the, 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 the regions is watering down education, the work that those students are working on at Leaders is extraordinary. And it is rigorous. I read that rubric. It is, there's a lot to read on that rubric. And try convincing me that a student sitting with a Barron's Regents Review book all day in a library, memorizing or trying to memorize dates and names of things that happened five, six hundred years ago, that's not rigorous to me. That is not rigor. I will debate that anytime because that's what I witnessed and observed with my own two eyes. What the type of work that students are working on that I uh, observed is actually far more rigorous, far more complex. And actually, it's amazing because they actually get to work on this during the course of the year. There's, not, there's no one big test that just they have to just you know, obsess over. It's, it's, they, they're working on it along the way. There are benchmarks along the way. Actually, this school has a unique, this is unique to the outward bound model. It's not for the all consortium, but they have something called crew, which is really interesting, where they're, they have like a homeroom. It's not even a home, but, but it's the same students throughout the year with the same crew teacher throughout the year, and they create a support network within that classroom for each other. And they, there's peer mentoring, peer tutoring, peer support. Everything that I was taught in school that we should be doing, they are doing, but it's not being shared across the system. And so that's why I do have to kind of ask, you're the superintendent that oversees these schools. Is there someone in a more larger macro role in DOE that says, hey, this is working here in these 38 schools. Can we apply this, these types of strategies and these thinking and this approach beyond 38 schools? And are there, are there schools that are interested in applying and also becoming consortium schools that are on a wait list. How long is this wait list? Tell us, tell us about these things. Sure. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I will say that certainly on your very first question in terms of collaboration, I mean, I think that is certainly one of the, the most important values and the hallmark of this particular administration that, you know, we're, we're really ensuring and doing our best to make sure that school to school, um, leaders to leaders, teachers to teachers, that there's that collabor collaboration that is in place. Um, and, and I certainly, you know, on behalf of that particular district, welcome people who want to learn more about those schools, come and visit. You know, I'd love to be able to go on a visit along with you um, and other members of the council. Um, I think when we're talking about um, uh, sort of officially becoming a member of a consortium, uh, um, I, I want to clarify that this, 
the particular variance that um, uh, Dr. Chen spoke about is a variance that is granted by the New York State Board of Education uh, and the New York State Regents. Um, uh, and uh, you know, while at the city, we certainly want to be able to encourage the kinds of practices that are in place, um, it's a state requirement that is there with regards to high school graduation. Um, uh, and uh, over the past several years, um, uh, New York State has not increased the number of schools. And so- But have you asked? So, you know, th there are many schools that are interested and- How many? Uh, we, I, I, as a superintendent, um, they don't reach out to me directly. Who do they um, reach out to? They, well, I would, they reach out to Ann Cook um, uh, of the- Who's amazing, but yes, she's here. And, and she hopefully will be able to speak to that a little bit more. Um, and, and I think really there, the dynamics are that, um, uh, you know, as somebody who helps supervise and le lead one of those schools, um, it's a complicated transition. Um, uh, and in particular, when we're thinking about schools that were designed under one particular model and shifting the mindsets of the students and the I, teachers. I would just respectfully add, I hear you that yeah. it's complicated. Um, dismantling inequity is complicated, but it's necessary. Yeah, I, I have no disagreement with that. Um, and so the, yeah. it, over the last several years, it's a five-year variance um, uh, at a time in which they grant, and they have not increased the number of schools. Um, I certainly you know, would be happy to, to work with you and others to think about um, uh, how might we be able to advocate um, uh, on behalf of those schools that are interested. In right. Now, in the testimony we heard, we heard about a Blue Ribbon Commission. Will the DOE uh, give names or make suggestions to the membership uh, uh, of the Regents Blue Ribbon Commission? As we get more information from the state, we will certainly engage uh, you and other uh, elected officials to advocate for ensuring that we have fair, multiple measured ways to um, determine graduation pathways. Right, so Dr. Chen, are, are, you, are you aware, who is, who is aware within DOE about the number of schools in addition to the 38 that are interested in uh, gr being granted such a waiver away from the traditional assessment model. Are, is anyone keeping a list? My understanding of the process is that schools that are interested would then reach out to the consortium and there would be a process involved. And as the superintendent mentioned, it is determined, the timeline and the processes are determined by the state. And so those are things that we do uh, track to make sure that folks have the opportunity and know where to go. And is there some sort of a, a report or a paper or something that summarizes some of the practices that are being applied, effective practices that are being applied in consortium that are being shared in non-consortium schools? Because I've been to many PDs during my career and I always mention that you know the, the cookies and muffins are very tasty at these PDs, but this is what I would have really appreciated seeing and hearing about, rather than test prep, because many PDs, that's why I asked you about how much the cost, many PDs were about how do we get more kids to pass the regents, when the work that they're doing is far more rigorous and far more meaningful in the lives of our students. Um, is, there a, is there a sort of concept paper, is there some sort of report that we could share PDF we could email to our, to our schools. So I will just jump in here. We have had um, a structure around showcase and learning partner schools in the past. That work will continue on in the instructional leadership framework, but that is a structure where schools learn from each other. It's the kind of professional development that you're describing, where they come together to learn from each other and the best practices, not only in a setting outside the classroom, but more importantly, inside school buildings, so they can actually see what is happening from the learning that they have been working on together. So in terms of the instructional leadership framework, part of the design of that is for schools to be able to learn from each other around best practices, and that's why it's so important that system-wide, that it isn't just limited to one network. Um, such as the network that we've described, so that all schools can learn about what consortium schools are doing, what international schools are doing, what all schools are doing across the city. Because as you know, we have very great um, work going on all over the city. So Dr. Chen, I, I taught at New Utrecht, mm -hmm. which is in the 11214 zip code. Leaders is in the 11214 zip code. No one ever partnered my school with leaders. 
they partnered me with other large high schools like Fort Hamilton and FDR where we shared information with each other, but we do the same thing. I would have much rather sat down with teachers from leaders and learned about what they're doing with students rather than just repeating the same practices within the traditional school models. Just a suggestion, because you have schools that are next to each other that are not talking to each other, and we really should, let me just move on. Although uh, uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, requires states to assess high school students in reading, language, arts, math, and science for the purposes of state accountability, no federal law requires high school exit exams. Today, as we heard, New York State is one of only 11 states that still require students to pass exams to graduate down from over half of all states. Why do you think so many states are moving away from exit exams, and does the DOE believe New York State should eliminate use of regents as a diploma requirement? This is why we look forward to this official capacity with the Blue Ribbon Com Commission at the State Ed Department because we do need to have this important conversation and subsequent action to determine what, it is, what is it that we need to do to ensure that there are fair and multiple pathways for our students for graduation. And I think that's why you've seen those changes in state exit uh, exam requirements across the country. And I appreciate you convening this conversation today, which is a great prelude to um, being, being able to, as you said, being heard by um, our New York State uh, Education Department. That is what is a critical and an important conversation for us to have and influence together. So I, and I appreciate that, but I'm, I'm not sure if I'm hearing an answer. What is the DOE's position on the Regents' exams being used as a requirement for diploma in our high schools? So, Regents are what, what I referred to earlier as outcomes-based assessments, and those outcome-based assessments have a role of some information, but not complete information about a student, much like what we saw earlier, where those assessments wouldn't capture the fullness of everything that Anthony Ramos knows and is able to do. And we support looking at the ability to have multiple measures to determine a student's graduation and pathway. I just There's wanted, value, but it's not the only measure that should be considered. And I'll also share with you one of the worst kept secrets in, in the school system is that if you're a, well, I could speak from the, some history teachers, is that if you're a history teacher teaching a regents class, I think I could speak from many of my colleagues that at some point in March of the year, you're told to stop what you're doing with your curriculum and shift over everything to regents prep. And so if you're teaching a global three or global four curriculum, usually you get stuck somewhere in World War II. And it's as if the world stops after World War II. So we just had a powerful, inspiring, transformative climate change march led by our young people. Ask the average high school history teacher if they can get through the curriculum to teach about the gravity of the issue of climate change. I had more time to discuss it in depth senior year government class, which has no regents, so I have more freedom to teach in that class. But everything was about making sure that the test was our guide. And if it was not tested, it was not being taught. And so, all the politicians cheer on the students for marching and leading and doing a great job. Meanwhile, they know that it is so difficult to get through that curriculum to even get to teach and discuss the biggest crisis facing our planet today. And so we are shortchanging students. We are shortchanging learning. There's a difference between testing and learning. We have to ask ourselves, Dr. Chen, do we actually value learning in the school system? Because what we're doing right now is not learning. Um, I have a few more, I'll be mindful of my colleagues in, the, in time. I'm also concerned about the mental health of students, particularly during testing season. Have any schools reached out to DOE about testing anxiety? 
Does the DOE have any knowledge of students visiting emergency room due to test-related anxiety or panic attacks? Are there increases in visits to school so social workers and counselors during testing season? And if so, how does DOE support schools with this influx? So in terms of incidents around testing season, we're not seeing any uh, significant differences in terms of the kinds of incidents that you're bringing up. We do focus, and it has been very clear from the chancellor, around focusing on teaching um, rigorous instruction throughout the day. And so when the test comes up is simply another time to be able to demonstrate their learning. And we do make sure that we um, reinforce the importance of learning uh, throughout the day that's not just focused on testing. So I I'm gonna give you some anecdotal data because I don't have anything concrete at this time. But I, I heard from one local hospital administrator in Southern Brooklyn that said to me that he could almost predict testing season based on the visits he sees in his ER from young people who come into the emergency room because of text, test anxiety and panic attacks. Um, also share with you that an administrator who oversees a guidance counselor department uh, of one of our large high schools shared that there are students who come in during high stakes testing season with evidence of self-harm because of the test associated with uh, uh, stress associated with exams. So just because you're not seeing it does not mean it's not happening. I'm not sure if you're looking to see it. I'm not sure if the DOE is actually uh, trying to find supportive ways of hearing from schools about the impact. First of all, when you mentioned in the testimony that the state moved from three days to two days, Dr. Chen, let's be clear why they made, they, they made that move. What they were doing to young children was outrageous. And I know some people are also applauding this announcement of the shift to make the test untimed altogether. They're not even giving them guidance on when to tell a child, are you okay? Just ask, are you, are you okay? Some students are just there for hours and hours and hours, and no one's just asking the child, are you okay? This is not, this is not learning. This is not even normal in my opinion. It's not backed by research in my view. So I do think we need to actually get more data on this because what I'm hearing from credible stakeholders is that there are students who are hurting themselves. There are students who are experiencing stress and anxiety, particularly during testing season. And if they lack social supports in the school, which we know they do, we have work to do. Um, I do want to note please. that um, we, part of this administration's focus is being able to support the social emotional learning of all students. I think you've heard a number of examples of our investments in those areas and that's important to us whether it's test anxiety, other anxieties, and thank you for your advocacy around social workers and so on. That has been tremendously helpful in pairing with our messaging to principals and teachers on the importance of the day-to-day -day learning that will continue to be a, a focus in this administration. Right, and Dr. Chen, and I appreciate that, and, I, and I, I'm hearing you saying that we should be looking at other assessments, we, the, the students are more than a test score, but I will tell you that the current DOE structure, when they visit schools, and this is folks that visit schools from, from Tweed and from Central, many of the questions asked of our school communities are based on those scores. When I was called in by administrators, the, the question was not really, how can I really sometimes support you? The, the issue was, Mark, I'm being grilled by Central. How do we get more kids to pass the test? And I had students that were absent, chronically absent, because they were facing enormous challenges at home. And respectfully, the last thing they cared about right now was a regents when they don't know where they were gonna sleep at night. And so if we're not caring for them, you know, for their whole needs, we're really shortchanging them. I want to turn to my colleagues who have been very patient. I'll begin with Council Member and, and Borelli, but just note that we, we will uh, start a clock just to be mindful of, of everyone's time. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned the climate change uh, uh, protest. <clears throat> Did the mayor and chancellor seek any guidance from the Conflict of Interest Board before allowing students uh, an excuse? 
I would not be able to speak to that, but we can certainly gather uh, a, a collective response to provide for you. Is there any, um, well, I, I did ask for one. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get one, so that's why I'm asking now. Um, is there any policy difference between two weeks ago versus today as to what protest students will be excused for? Again, I would want to make sure we get that information from our other offices to be able to provide you accurate information. Um, so we're talking about test taking, and I noticed that at MassPeth High School, 98% of uh, students graduated within four years, which is significantly higher than the citywide averages. Um, it's, it's impressive. Obviously, there have been some allegations of cheating. Uh, has the DOE begun an investigation of those claims? We take all such allegations seriously uh, around academic integrity. And uh, when those came up, we did refer those, uh, those allegations into SCN, and, and currently there's an investigation underway, yes. So some of the other schools in the same uh, school district, I think District 24, have um, equally remarkable um, statistics. So in one, PSIS 87, uh, actually where 18% of kids go to Maspeth, uh, they have a 100% pass rate on core math, English, science, and social science exams. Now 100% is remarkable because 100% means not one child uh, has failed or, or, or not passed uh, their classes. So how come only 42% of the students there pass their math exams? How, how, can, how, can, they, they, how, how can we marry that between 100% um, of the students passing, which is remarkable, versus only 42% of the students pass? Mr. Chair, can I, can I have some more time? Uh, just to be mindful, but I'll give you an extra minute, Council Member, just sure. to follow up for an issue on your question. We would need to speak with the school and, and get a sense from them directly on what those differences would be, looking at the instruction and the uh, abilities of the students. I, I would not be able to give you an answer here. So just down the road from PS uh, IS 87, there's junior high school eight. Um, same situation, 90% of the kids pass their core classes, but less than a third pass math and English. I'm not gonna ask the same question, but I'm gonna ask something different. You guys rate PSIS 87 as fair, as far as uh, student achievement. You rate JHS 8 as good, three out of four, in student achievement. How do you justify the fact that at one school where more kids pass the curriculum and pass the state exams is fair, whereas the adjacent school um, less kids pass the curriculum and less kids pass the state exam and that's a, a good school theoretically for the purposes of student achievement. We have a number of metrics for student achievement. Um, I can certainly have Alice Brown delineate what those are but it would come down to the differences between all of those metrics between those two schools. What, what can be more important than both and passing and This will be your class. final question just to move on. This final question yep. you can answer and then we can move on. Thanks. What, what is the what is more important than passing the school standard for passing the grade and the state standard? What could be, if both of those are higher in one school and you're saying that's worse than the other school, how, how, what other metrics could be, be weighing on that? Do you want to go through the, the metrics? I think when you see a difference um, between the, the grades that students are using and what you're, um, I believe that's what you're referring to and that the two junior high schools that you mentioned, um, it's that next ready levelness uh, metric, which is taking in the multiple measures that we're talking about versus the one single test score. So I, I believe that's what you were referring to. So we're here today talking about what does that one single test score mean? Um, and in this case, it's the ELA and the math exams from the state um, versus all the work that students do across an entire year in many multiple formats to show their mastery um, and their growth towards the state standards. So those I'll, are included in the elementary. So I, I, I thought and you were going to say math. the next level readiness, and I'll end it here. 
my next question is we're going to go into the schools that these kids go into because clearly they're not ready for the next level, but I'll yield the rest of the time. I have none left anyway. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Burrowey, for, for your question. I, just, I, I would note that I've always argued that any state report of our schools should come with an asterisk noting how much money New York State owes the New York State school system. Because I find it really interesting when the state produces all these fancy, glossy reports of our schools, knowing that they're still shortchanging us, default of a lawsuit, my professor, uh, Bloomfield, who educated me so well in class, that they lost, and are yet are lecturing us and trying to tell us about um, how to do better. So pay your bill, Albany. St start with that. Um, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Chair. Um, talking about Massmouth High School again, it's in my district. And we've had now almost a dozen teachers come forward and say that there's a no-fail policy at Massmouth High School. And uh, then we, we're seeing on, certainly on social media, that it's happening all over. There's no-fail policy. Are, is the administration allowed of a particular school allowed to change a grade without notifying the teacher of that particular grade? Like, let's say the student got a 55 and somehow it magically changes to 65. So again, academic integrity is important to us. We also have um, academic policies around grading that I'll ask Alice Brown to um, summarize. I'm sorry. Uh, teachers, um, each school should have a grading policy um, that is well known to all of the teachers and the students. Um, and the teachers who um, are in charge of each class um, should administer those grades. Um, if there is such a change, that change should be discussed and the teacher should enter that change. But the administration cannot change it. Right. Okay, so is it against regulations, against the law, against? Um, it's our, it's the policy that it's we a policy. Our okay. to be able to um, know the grades that they're giving and, can, and um, have them be aligned to the grading policy as, as has been published to all of the students um, and the parents so that they know what the expectations of the course are. Okay, so, so we have for years, it's not only a few years, we have a lot of evidence, a mountain of evidence that says there is a no-fail policy, and a no-fail policy now in many, many schools. And I'm just wondering why DOE has never red flagged any of this, uh, that faculty, teachers are being driven out, good teachers who won awards from other schools when they come to Massbeth High School are driven out because they refuse to change grades, they refuse to have a no-fail policy, and they are then given bad evaluations and driven out of the system. And this has been going on, allegedly, for years, and we notified DOE of this, we notified the investigators, and it took three or four weeks for them to even come around and interview the whistleblowers. So this is a real, and, and what we're hearing around the city that this is going on, it's widespread, systemic. So, and by the way, I just want to ask one question, Chair, one other question, because I know my time is up. Um, do special ed education students get, is there extra funding available for the school for accepting special education students? We have a fair student funding formula, and according to that formula, there are associated weights for characteristics um, aligned to the needs of students. Yeah, and so. And that, in, with students with disabilities included in that. And so we've seen, there was an article in, in Sunday's Post that we saw a student graduate early um, who never attended class in the senior year. He graduated six months earlier in December. Uh, and is that being investigated? Uh, because this is going on, not, we just, now we're getting more people coming forward that other special needs students are graduating early because they're problems and the school gets rid of them. And is anybody red flagging this? All right, so you can answer and then I, I, I move on. But you can answer the question. Uh, 
Um, I think that it's what Dr. Chen said earlier, that all of those allegations um, are part of now the uh, SCI and, and OSI investigation. Okay, and so I just want to turn to more of my colleagues. Uh, those are very serious allegations made at, at, uh, at Maspeth, and I am hearing that there is an active investigation by both SCI and OSI, so that is just um, welcome news that there's, there's, there are folks who are following up to take appropriate so action when necessary. OSI. Just I would to be just specific, I'm sorry. OSI. Sorry, just to be specific, OSI. OSI, forgive me. OSI, yes. Um, just to note, very, very, also important is that equally important in terms of uh, following up on the seriousness of the allegations is also the idea of also due process, mm -hmm. and not also, um, you know, issuing verdicts via tweet uh, or social media. Um, we there has to be follow up here, uh, but just because a story is published somewhere doesn't mean the whole story is true or, the, or again, the fullness of the story. I have seen that through my experience being a public school teacher, particularly by certain folks who have an agenda, in my view, to really hurt the public school system. And the whole issue of cheating in general, think about what we're talking about. Uh, folks who feel pressured or folks who are accusing administration officials of pressuring them to pass tests rather than talking about learning and comprehensive curriculum and finding ways to bring out student t t talents and strengths. This is one of the impacts of a testing culture that's just hyper-driven in our school system. They're not talking about learning, they're just talking about tests. And, and this is a part of the hearing. News to my colleagues, this is a part of our hearing. We are not focusing on learning in our schools when everything is just about tests. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Barron. Thank you to the chair and thank you to the panel for coming. Uh, just a few quick questions. You mentioned an increase in the percentage of students who are taking the AP exams. What is the data on the students who are passing or achieving the score that uh, shows that they have completed that successfully? We have, we're just looking to see if we have that with us right now. Um, so in, in 2018, 55,011 students uh, took at least one AP exam, 28,581 passed at least one of those AP exams. So since uh, 2017, that was an increase of 11.4 uh, percentage point of the number taking and 10.7% increase of the number passing. Um, that's, that's great. But you know, I also want to talk about the reflection of how much, and Mr. Chair, just a minute, just to notice, it took a minute for them to get me my answer. So uh, I'm gonna add that time back. We'll work a little faster. Um, but um, Board of Regents Chancellor Betty Rosa said that the board will be meeting to examine, quote, to what degree requiring passage of regents exams improves student achievement, graduation rates, and college readiness. So again, these high stakes tests, they may be getting improvement in the percentage of the number of children passing, but we don't know what positive impact that may have on the student moving forward. And secondly, what is the budget that the DOE has for all those companies that prepare testing material? particularly Pearson's? Um, the, the testing material for Pearson for um, the Shazad and the GNT I gave earlier, so I can find that again. Um, but what percentage of the budget goes to the, with the, that contract for testing? The percentage of the overall budget? Mm -hmm. I, I don't have that. Okay, Th I would like to get that information. In terms of the consortium schools, how were they selected? I'll ask the superintendent to join uh, to respond more specifically to that question. Can you repeat that question? Yes, how were the participants uh, in the consortium schools, how were they selected? 
what schools, what criteria determine the schools that participated? So the, the schools that are in the consortium um, uh, reach out to the consortium, which is an independent, non-DOE organization. Um, what uh, outreach was done to those schools to, for them to know that this opportunity existed? Because are, are they all, are there's a concentration of them in a particular geographic area? No, they're, they're spread out over all four boroughs. Um, uh, yeah, they're, they're not concentrated in any. <laughs> five, or, four out of the they're five in four boroughs. of the five boroughs. Sorry. Okay, all right. Um, and then finally, um, does the DOE have on its website any notice to parents that they have the right to opt out of testing without any consequences? Because parents who are friends of mine have said that they've been told that if their child's absent and opts out, there will be negative consequences. And I've told them, go back and tell that principal that's not true. So I don't know if the DOA has such a policy. If not, I'd like to offer that we prepare that, uh, Mr. Chair, so that it be noted on the website that that is an option that they have without penalty. There is information for families on the website, and that is also shared with principals so that they are aware and are in alignment with what we've communicated to families. So does it say and on the website, parents, your child, you can opt your child, you can opt out for your child and there are no consequences? Is that what it says? It doesn't say those words exactly, uh -huh. um, but it does provide them the opportunity to refuse the state exam for their students. Um, and that information is also backpacked home so that families get it even if they're not looking on the website for that. Well, it wasn't in that particular child's backpack because the parent does go through it. And it said the contrary, don't miss having your child here because it affects our rating and there will be consequences. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, thank you, Councilman Barron. I think you know your point is well made uh, that the onus should not be on parents and families communities, the DOE has a responsibility to inform folks of their rights. Just in the case, and the answer we heard with regards to the knowledge of the consortium schools, that the onus should not be just on the school. DOE should be proactively informing school communities about opportunities that exist within its system. And it just, it amazes me that you have like these schools that are really onto something really promising that address that address areas of education that historically have, have plagued the system. And we're not talking to each other. And so there's a lot of work to do. So I, I wanna thank you for that. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember King. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you both. I have a quick question for, how long have you been with the DOE? In this leadership role. In this leadership role, this is my second year, but I was previously a teacher and a principal and a literacy supervisor in the DOE. Okay, and you as well? Um, 22 years. 22, 22 years in leadership? Oh, no. Okay, no. so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that none of you have been part of the structure of putting together the DOE for the last 25 years. Can I, can I assume that I'm correct? You didn't put the rules together for the DOE in the last, we're just going 25 years. Right. 25. Okay, I'm just gonna go there first. So right now, then I'm saying that you're not responsible for the crumbling or the mismanagement or some of these bad ideas that have been placed on our children and our teachers and our principals that have to have to manage the correctness that's always changing depending on the chancellor or whoever's at the top of the hill. So I'm asking you right now to figure out ways to when you see something that is wrong, how do we correct it? The DOE over points of time, People will say it's not segregated, but parts of it is segregated. You have a consortium, you have charter schools, you have public schools who operate under different purviews depending who's sitting, who's managing it. So I'm saying to you all, how do you all come together in the world of testing? I'm not a guy who says testing is a bad thing, but I just think it's the be all to everything. And we had a great young man who came in and told his testimony of how he had to navigate a system that kind of just was biased towards him because he wasn't a great, academic student. Again, not every student needs to know the definition of pi and what is x squared minus four squared hypothesized by, by, by. That has nothing to do with anything when you move on in your life. 
but we be held accountable if we don't understand it at 14, 15 years of age, and it, and it hurts us later on when we're trying to get scholarships or when we're trying to graduate. Right then, that just says to me there's a system that is biased to some of our students. When we can have a consortium school that's getting it right, but our kids who live on 149th Street in Mont Avenue or Brownsville don't have access to that type of education. So I'd like to know, the first thing, Anthony Ramos' story is not new to you all. What have you done to build on his story to, f to allow children who are on that path to have greater access to graduating and being a great student? That's my first question. My second question, you mentioned something about these surveys and people come back and give you assessments of all the data they've collected. Who are the people who are gathering this data and do they reflect the children who are in the school system? Reason I asked that question, I went into a high school system where I saw 90% of the administrative was one ethnicity and another 90% of the students were totally different than the leadership in the building. So there's definitely a disconnect from what the students are going through each and every day to the people who are supposed to be educating them. Second, that's my second question. Then I would like to know from all of the education that's being taught in, with these testing, where are we teaching our kids to? Because if I'm good at drawing, maybe I don't need to understand all these different fractions. If I'm good at acting, maybe I don't need to have to understand some of the other things you're holding me accountable on a region's test. The basics, every child needs to know is how to write, where to put a semicolon, learn a little bit about history, and then that means it's inclusive of everybody's history, not one particular story in, in, on this globe. And how do, we, how do we manage that And when it comes to making sure that we have a good education curriculum for our kids and are in there? Okay. So I will tackle the first and third questions because I, I see some relationship between those and then I will also have Alice Brown share the process for the report card, the surveys, and the quality reviews, those, those reports that you mentioned. To your point, regardless of who is leader, what you are seeing right now under this administration and this chancellor is that, that the need to even the playing field and ensure that there's access and opportunity, and I would also say an expectation for attainment of learning for every student. So you see those things in some of the signature initiatives, the, the excellence and, and equity initiatives around college access for all, AP for all. Those are examples of what we are doing to make sure that we um, are giving access and opportunity into the question asked about attainment rates and AP to make sure that all our students are able to attain those skills and knowledge as well. Um, and, and part of that work is also making sure that we have um, streamlined these expectations for schools, if you will. So I shared briefly around the instructional leadership framework. The idea there is to make sure, and to segue a little bit to your third question, that every school has a coherent and full curriculum. So what we heard from Anthony Ramos, this, this ability to have an education that meets all of their needs. So every student, whether or not you're an Anthony Ramos that ends up um, having a career in the arts or not, you have exposure. It's the right of every student to have exposure and access and attainment to a full education. And that is part of what we expect through our instructional leadership teams at the schools to make sure that they figure out how to make that content and those standards that the state expects us to teach. And that is across all content areas, including the arts, including world languages, including physical education, that all students are attaining that in a way that, they, that considers who they are. And that piece is important to this administration, similar to some things that the chancellor announced yesterday around our instructional approach and the importance of aligning and identifying who our students are, leveraging their strengths and their identities in their learning, and to learn the identities and the characteristics and perspectives of those outside of themselves and their own immediate um, uh, culture and context as well. So those are the things that we are doing that, in in terms of what the chancellor has also shared, is to really be able to change the systems and structures so that regardless who is at the helm at the moment, to your point, that we are making sure that we are developing these capacities and systems that will not go away depending on who is in leadership at the time. And part of that is through our comprehensive supports uh, framework, which is having an ability to share um, with schools with each other, to learn from each other, but also to look at 
every school doesn't need the same thing and the same kinds of supports. It is our responsibility centrally to be able to know our schools well through our executive superintendent structure, to be able to allocate the support supports where they're most needed so that every student does indeed be able to access and attain those opportunities that we're speaking of. So I'll have Alice answer some of the questions around who does the surveys and the, and the quality review reports. Um, the, the multiple measures um, that have been used in this administration um, include having uh, surveys. We survey our students in grades six through 12, our teachers um, of all of the grades, and our parents of all of the students. Um, we invite them to participate in the survey, and those measures get included in our school quality reports. There are other um, measures that we use, like a school quality review, and also we use student achievement data and some other data that um, compile those reports. I think you might have asked specifically, um, who are the, the people who do that? Am I, am I right? Yeah, because I was gonna, what are going to make about the ethnicity of everyone who's part of the process? Because, again, I go back to a school when 90% of administration was one ethnicity, and the children were a whole another uh, ethnicity. So I know there's a breakdown in relationship, whether whatever thoughts or thinking or how much energy gets put in there, is there any bias into this conversation, you know, whether implied or not, or, you know, so I just want us to be honest in a conversation when it comes to the Department of Education, when you look at the makeup of the DOE, who is doing what for a system that has 70% people of color in it, but the other, and the, the leadership throughout all the schools don't reflect that. So how do we have a real conversation? I was, all I'm asking you all, if you see your problem, and I end with this as you answer this question, what do you think is your number one issue when it comes to curriculum? And if you know what that is, how do we seriously address it other than talking points in a conversation. Okay, so you can answer and this will be the final because we have to move on, sure. Thank you, Mr. Sure, Peter. sure. Yeah. It, I would say the number one challenge is to make sure that every student gets access and attainment to a full curriculum taught at the highest levels where there's expectation for every student to learn. That is our, our greatest challenge of being able to have every student, and part of that challenge is making sure that we understand who every student is in order for them to be able to partake in that education. So it's the, the, the high standard for everyone and the ability to differentiate for every one of our students. That's the challenge before us. Okay, so thank you and we, we will move on. Uh, I think Council Member Borelli had a second round of questions. Sure, I don't think I have time to explain all the stats, but I'm looking at one middle school in the same district as MassBath. And uh, this school has 98% passing rate of the courses, uh, but only 5% of the students passing the state exams. I'm looking at another school in, this, in a similar district, I think it's the same district, where less students, 90% pass the core courses, but a lot more pass the state exams. And I followed these two middle schools to the high schools to where the majority of their students are going. Does it surprise you that the outcomes at the high school where kids who pass, the higher amount of kids pass the state tests did better than the high school where less kids pass the state test? In other words, are state exams a good indicator of future success? Or at least better than perhaps in this case, your passing rate, or the school's passing rate? I think that is the central core of this, the conversation, the very conversation we're having, which is that it is one single measure and it measures a certain amount of what a student knows, but not the complete uh, reflection of, of what the student is learning in school. But I mean, we're not, we're not really gauging, we, we, we can't gauge the, this entire metaphysical uh, needs of a student. We're, we're looking for ways to predict outcomes and measure our success in the classrooms. Do you think standardized tests are a good method of that? It's a method that we currently have that gives us insight as a system because we are responsible for over a million students in the system. It gives us insight as to what kinds of things we do need to do. It gives us insight into are there areas of the curriculum that we need to pay more attention to when we see trends of students um, struggling in particular aspects of mathematics or aspects of English language arts? 
um, that is what the state assessments uh, allow us to do. It, it gives us a, a look ahead, if you will, for schools to think about what's the overall planning for the students that are coming into them that happen to have. Should, should parents be concerned schools? if their school has a passing rate on state exams of only 5%? I'm sorry, can you repeat the Should question? Should parents be concerned that a school that their child attends has a passing rate on state exams of only 5%? I think that as one indicator, uh, I, we, we hope that families will look at everything that the DOE provides about a school. So is that why it's more important than to give the school the higher rating? Is it more important? I think it's looking at the full measure, and I think parents um, would want to look at what else does the school provide. Um, of course they would want to know the data that you're referring to, but I believe that all of our uh, school quality reviews and the numbers, of the, the amount of data we have on the website does provide um, our families with multiple measures and we do hope they look critically at all of those measures, including the surveys and perceptions of, of um, parents and uh, other parents and teachers. So then my final question then is, is back on cheating. Um, can you just explain to me why uh, Kathleen Elvin is still on the job if, if uh, OSI um, determined that she had um, passed kids who did not perform the critical parts of their curriculum? As I mentioned earlier, this matter is under investigation and we certainly would not uh, be making personnel uh, commentary either. I mean, this is, this is from 2014. I mean, she's still on the payroll of DOE, correct? We could, we, we can confirm that and get back to you in terms of... I, I know it's confirmed. I'm kind of asking why. That's, that's kind of the question. I, I if we're serious about cheating, we, 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 can't, right. we can't have it both ways. We can't be mm -hmm. serious about cheating, but when the OSI brings charges against someone um, and nothing happens to them, I think that's, I mean, that, that's where I'll leave it. I will refer to Chair Traeger's comment earlier, too, around due process. So there are multiple number of uh, things here, but I, I couldn't comment on that personnel matter. Yeah, and there's a lot to unpack, but I, I, I do have some uh, critical follow-up questions, and I want to hear from students as well. Um, This, again, as mentioned before to my colleagues, the, the, there are serious allegations made and there must be criti critical follow-up in terms of investigations. I do believe that this is an outgrowth in one of the impacts of a hyper-driven culture that's driven by exams. And to answer Councilmember Borelli's question about whether state exams are the best indicator of student success, I think we heard from Anthony Ramos the, the clear answer. Um, a student that was labeled by the state and by the city as underperforming is one of the best performers ever to hit, a broad, to hit the Broadway stage. And I think that is kind of the crux of what we're trying to get at, is that have we built a system, or are we perpetuating a system that uh, only captures a small fraction of student abilities and actually perpetuates inequality and injustice in our communities, in our government, in our society. So I think that that's really the, the crux of some of, the, some of these matters. And I would also ask the question about the school with the 5% uh, the passing rate. Um, how much is that school owed in terms of resources? Because I met, I, I have schools that, you know, the state would label as struggling, but they're lacking about four or $500,000 of critical state funding and they're desperate to hire a full-time guidance counselor. New York State doesn't even mandate that elementary schools have guidance counselors. Um, our schools need them, and social workers, and supports. Because as I mentioned before, it's very hard to think about passing a test when you're not sure where you're going to sleep at night, if, having, if you'll have a warm meal at night, and how you're gonna pay the bills to make ends meet. Um, you can't divorce these realities, and no one's making excuses. What you heard from Anthony was not, he didn't ask for a handout, he asked for a shot. Let's be clear, he asked for a shot, and we are denying kids that shot. That's the point. Now, I have some final, final follow-up questions to the DOE that I wanna hear from, from students. Has DOE analyzed the relationship between class size and test scores?
No, we have not. I would appreciate some data on that because Again, this is my former teacher hat on right now. Class size does make a difference in terms of instruction, in terms of learning, and I would appreciate some data from DOE on that. Um, how, and actually, Anthony Ramos' story talked about that as well. He mentioned a class of over 35 students, which I believe actually contractually is even higher than what's supposed to be in a high school. I think it's 34. Uh, I had overcrowded classrooms as well. Um, next question, how many students in the school year 2018, 2019 received testing accommodations? I think we will need to get that information back to you. We do not have that with us. So the number, total number of students yeah, receiving testing accommodations, right. Um, and also, uh, f forgive me, uh, we, we uh, missed, Councilmember Holden has a follow-up question as well, so I wanna give him time to ask his follow-up. Forgive me, uh, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, does each school come up with their own or establish their own grading policy? Um, the schools uh, publish their grading policies. We give guidance for how to do so. Um, and then they, have a grading policy um, per school, per, per even subject area if they want to, because you might have different expectations, right, right. for arts versus social yeah, studies. Yeah, so different schools grade yeah. different ways. And they, they have slight, and some uh, schools mu grade a little bit more lenient, possibly, or, or more strict. And that's, that's in, throughout the system in, in different classes. But, but how does a student, let me know the process of how a student graduates early. Is there, is there a process they have to go to DOE and put an application in? And is that, how is that possible? Uh, students uh, have credit and exam requirements for graduation, so when they meet them, they're eligible for graduation. And does anybody oversee that? Let's say DOE, Central? For the graduation of each individual, the school has um, multiple checkpoints throughout the uh, career of the student to see that they are meeting the requirements, both of credits and exams. And then the staff at the school, generally a guidance counselor, um, works through to be sure that those um, particular subject area requirements are met and the exam, and, and then presents it for uh, approval from the administration for a student to graduate. So it's, it's all within the school. So if somebody wanted to, uh, if the school wanted that person to graduate early, there's no outside um, entity that evaluates that. That approves the, not if the requirements okay. are met. But that explains a lot of it. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, this EDUSTAT, um, that it's like a comp stat. Um, it, will that be an oversight? Uh, will the principal come before this, this body of uh, performance management? Uh, will they, is that how it will work? EDUSTAT is a process and a protocol that we did fashion after learning from CompStat as right. well as uh, ChildStat and ACS. And it is to measure the system's health. So currently the plan is not for an individual principal to come before, but we do this in groups such as in the borough by executive superintendent groups. Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks, Chair. All right. Okay. Um, that actually is going to be my next question. Uh, well, actually, I, I have some other questions related to EDUSTAT. Uh, earlier this year, the administration, as we heard, announced the development of EDUSTAT, a performance management system modeled on the NYPD's CompStat and ACS ChildStat. Can you provide us with more details related to what this system will entail, and how is this system different than ARIS, a system that I had to endure when I was a teacher in the school system. I had to endure that as well as a principal yes. chair, so I yes. commiserate. It is not a data system like ARIS was. It is really a process and a protocol um, tracking certain data points to make sure, um, sometimes the chancellor talks about it like a checkup. When you go in, wh whatever reason you're going in to see the doctor, you, you know, get your blood pressure taken and, and those kinds of things. So it is a way for us to have a health check on how we are doing as a system and importantly, for us to respond as a system to places where 
um, perhaps course accumulation isn't on track in the way that it should be? What do we then need to do as a system to support and ensure that every student is on track to graduation? So can you provide some additional details? What will the system entail? What will this give you that you don't have right now? What it will give us is a way to look at one particular group. So the example that I used earlier was through um, a borough or executive superintendent supervision to look at that group of schools, to look at a number of indicators, and Alice can talk a little bit more about this, but we want to make sure, and again, we are starting this. This is different. This is not something the system has done before. But we need to be able to look at one large group of schools at a time to be able to hold, frankly, ourselves accountable at Central around some of the various questions that have come up today are around what's happening at in individual schools. Something like an EDUSTAT is going to lift up in regularity a routine and a process for us and the chancellor is part of every one of these sessions and senior leadership so that we have requisite oversight and most importantly supports to ensure that every student is on track. How do you reassure someone like me mm -hmm. that this is not just another fancy endeavor to tell us what we already know in a very fancy expensive way? While it is new, um, it does have, it, it really is about in what I would frame as internal accountability for us to be able to do something for our schools. Now, what is part of this, I would say, too, that's important here, is that there is also progress monitoring that's aligned where schools on an individual basis are measuring their own goals and where they're meeting every student that's aligned to what every superintendent is doing in terms of their schools, which is aligned to what every executive superintendent is doing around the oversight of an entire borough. And this simply is, to some degree, a central version of making sure that we have all of our systems in place and know when things flag that we have a way to systematically catch those things. And that, I think, is the key here, is that there's a systematic catch, much like ComStat and ChildStat. There's a way where regularly we come together and we're able to see things flag, and that means we must do something about that. And there are solutions on the spot that happen as a result of this. And that is what I would say to you is a, a main purpose of that. Can you provide us with a cost breakdown of Edustat? Okay, we can give that to you. We can provide that information. Yeah, we, for you. we, we need that information. I and I respectfully we need that information. That this is um, as someone who lived through the Aris era, uh, respectfully I heard many similar things where I just heard now about what the promise of ARIS was. Um, it was also hard to utilize ARIS in a school that didn't have adequate computers and internet access as well. Um, and so we need well, to, yeah. Believe me, I remember the, uh, <laughs> the circle uh, waiting circle. So it is, I just want to be very clear, and I, I don't think I was, that it is not a data system like a data dashboard where someone logs into this. It is a protocol on a process where key leaders in the DOE, including the chancellor, come together to ensure that we are tracking um, what should be on progress, if you will. But so it's not, there's not a logging into something. I just want to be very clear about right. that. Right, and so I think ARIS costs in excess, I don't have it in front of me, in excess of 180 million, somewhere in that range. Let me tell you what we already know. We already know that many of our schools desperately need more school counselors and social workers. Just imagine, how many counselors we can get with $180 million or so. So if all of this is just gonna simply find a new way to regurgitate what we already know or what we already should know in a fancy title, I'd rather invest in schools directly. I'd rather get money into those schools to hire more social workers, school counselors, find better ways, effective ways to assess student proficiency and mastery uh, art, music, physical education. I mean, I, I, but I do want to hear more. And also, 
has uh, the DOE engaged NYPD and ACS to learn from those agencies the issues and challenges faced when they implemented their respective systems? Both agencies were gracious enough to have cabinet members and those involved in the design of EDUSAT to not only observe but have um, discussions around some of those very uh, challenges. Again, of course, we're looking at different kinds of um, data points, but I must extend, you know, on behalf of the Chancellor, our gratitude for those agencies and sharing their lessons learned. Right. I'll just tell you that as someone that worked in the school system and at times the school had to interact with ACS, and I'm saying this respectfully, the feedback that we would get from ACS to our school, hire more social workers, hire more support staff in your school. So if that data is going to be memorialized in a new way, I hope it reaches someone that has the power to make a decision to get us more supports in our system. Um, earlier, uh, let me just get to the final, and then we hear from our colleagues, my, my uh, the students here. We understand that principals were told that DOE intends to administer a single, uniform, new assessment four times a year in place of school-selected periodic assessments. Is this true? If so, what assessment is this, and when will this information be shared with families Will this uh, be an off-the-rack off assessment that the city purchases? So yes, the chancellor has shared the need for us as a system to be able to know how every student is doing at any particular grade level uh, prior to a state exam, which is really an outcome that happens after we have the ability to do something about this while the student is still in that grade, if you will. So yes, we are looking at a long-term plan of having a formative assessment system. Um, and the reason why um, one, one single measure as part of many, right? So that's one way of being able to see how all students are doing so that we can, most importantly, it's not about, this is not a high stakes, this is about informing us as to what we need to do to better support our students. And it is difficult to compare or be able to see the differences, um, whether it's equity of resources or um, impact, if there are multiple different assessments happening simultaneously. The idea is to streamline and to have one that um, are, and one, what we're looking into right now actively is one that schools are already using. So I do want to um, be clear that a lot of these practices are some things that schools are already doing and electing to do on their own. And we'd just like to be able to do that centrally with some subset of schools to begin with during the course of this right. year. But Dr. Chen, you just kind of answered my, <laughs> schools already should be conducting formative assessments with students. And what I'm hearing goes against a lot of the training I received as a teacher when I was told over and over and over again, including on PDs I went to when I worked for the DOE, was to differentiate my instruction. What they never differentiated was assessments, but they always said to differentiate your instruction. And now we're we just had a whole discussion on the gravity and the impact tests have on our schools, and we're saying that we're going to implement another one. You see, teachers that I've worked with, when we first start teaching in our, you know, I taught in high school, we like to advance low stakes assessments that give us baseline data to work with to see where our kids are at without the pressure and the stress and just work with them during the course of the year. I think without, you, you could just simply call a school and speak to a teacher and get some data on formative work. Rather than investing in a new fancy test, uh, you, you, will, you will save money, headaches, bad press, from simply picking up the phone and calling an educator on how kids are doing and what their needs are in a school building. So I would like to f learn more and find out more information about this because I have concerns about instituting or requiring more, uh, more assessments that I, quite frankly, I'm not sure what exactly we're measuring anymore. 
other than just uh, paying test companies a lot of money. If I so, might, the, yes. the, the concept that you expressed as a teacher of being able to look at baseline information, to be able to then make decisions about your teaching and meeting the needs of every student, that is the purpose of a formative assessment system. And again, this is something that many schools are already engaging with. This will not necessarily be a new um, resource for schools. Right, so, so why spend money to institute the, something that we're already doing? I think the difference is that we're doing it in a number of different ways. And so that doesn't allow the system to be able to provide the resources and supports in um, the most needed areas. And that is why, for the very same reason that you, reasons that you're expressing, is to be able to determine what those needs are and to be able to provide those supports. All right, so we, we'll, we'll follow up uh, with more discussions on that. And I think uh, with that, I thank the panel uh, for, for your time. Um, next, we're gonna hear uh, from the next panel, uh, Jeannie Ferrari. Uh, Kawani de la Cruz Reyes, Luca, uh, Cheyenne Pena, uh, Brian, Larissa Tejeda, and Alex Brooks. Folks, each uh, witness will be given around two minutes to speak, and th there could be some additional follow-up, but, but I appreciate everyone's time and patience today. Um, no, uh, well, we can, uh, yeah, if you'd like a copy. Here we go. These are all of them, up front and back. Sit down. Yeah. They wrote. I have more than one. Do you want more than one? Do you want more than one? I have three. Yeah, okay, so sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, huh? let's see. Would, uh, should I? Okay. Do you want me to begin? And then, okay. How do you turn it off? I don't know. Uh, okay. Yes, whenever you're ready, okay. you, you may begin. Just uh, tell us your name and you can get started. All right, and we'll go this way. So my name is Jeannie Ferrari. I am principal of Humanities Preparatory Academy. Uh, we are a consortium uh, high school uh, located in Manhattan. We are unusual. We're a hybrid model of enrollment. So half of our students come to us as ninth graders uh, from all five boroughs, uh, and the other half are transfer students, which means they may have struggled in another school setting. Sometimes they were in a school with a high stakes testing culture, uh, and they want to find something that's more tailored to their needs as individuals uh, and more nurturing. So uh, I'm just going to read a statement. It has to do more with uh, college preparation um, in consortium schools. So standardized tests like the Regents assess compliance, recall, memorization, speed, how to follow directions, and how to sort. These skills were very useful in the past century when the majority of our students were trained for routine labor in factories, but they're very outdated in the 21st century. What and how we choose to assess drives everything from instruction, culture, equity, and even safety in a school. New York State students, many of whom are English language learners or have IEPs, are subjected to entire courses designed to prepare them for tests. Many are taught to cram, memorize, recall, sit still, be quiet, and follow directions. What we assess shows what we value, and it also shows what we value in our children. Our chancellor has courageously set a vision of equity and access for all students in New York City. Let's adopt an assessment system that aligns with those values. My school, Humanities Prep, is part of a consortium of high schools in New York City and New York State who assess students based on their performance on a series of research projects called PBATs, or PBAs. These projects are aligned with uh, state standards and common core standards. Each student presents a minimum of four PBAT projects in their core subject areas, and they present them to a panel of teachers and an outside evaluator who is a member of the community and often an expert in the field the student is presenting in. This, am I done? Okay. They spend a lot of time preparing for these projects and presentations. They are tailored to the individual learning needs of each student and ensures that each student gets consistent and meaningful feedback about their work. Perhaps most exceptionally, PBAT projects teach and assess college and career readiness skills for the 21st century, skills that use reasoning and logic to solve a problem. 
They help teach students how to determine the validity of evidence and arguments, find credible and strong sources to support ideas, make connections between an issue and its larger social and political context, revise written work, present ideas to an audience in a clear and convincing way, collaborate with others on a team to find solutions to complex problems, develop stamina and persistence in the writing process, and utilize experimental design. These are the things we want our kids to know when they go to college, not how to memorize, not how to cram, and not how to sort. The PBATs measure much more rigorous skills than the Regents, but each student is supported individually to master them. It is not one size fits all. Assessing students in this way would fundamentally shift how students engage with school if this were widespread. As a principal, I know that my students have truly succeeded when they graduate from college, not necessarily when they graduate from high school, not even when they get into college, but when they graduate from college. And every single graduate who has come back to humanities prep has told me that the single most important uh, process that prepared them for college was the PBAT, was going through this, was getting the feedback, and practicing, and rehearsing, and revising. I hope that New York State and New York City will lead the way towards a truly equitable, rigorous, and effective assessment system that truly measures what students actually know and can do. Thank you. I, I liked your opening better than mine. Please, <laughs> go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Larissa Tejeda. I graduated from Humanities Preparatory Academy this past June as valedictorian, and I am currently a freshman at Brooklyn College. Humanities Preparatory Academy is a small New York City public high school that is in the New York Performance Consortium, a group of schools that focus on portfolio-based assessments as a graduation requirement rather than regents' exams. For those who don't know, my former school, Humanities Preparatory Academy, and the other schools in the consortium are exempt from New York State's regents' exams, with the exception of the English regents, and use portfolio-based assessment tasks, or PBATs, as an alternative. My classmates and I all wrote research papers in the four core subjects, English, history, math, and science, and present the, presented them to a panel of teachers that read, questioned, and graded us off both our writing and presentation skills. Personally, my four PBATs were empowering, empowering and allowed me to be the intellectual I am today. As a freshman at prep, I was taught how to co properly write a cohesive, well-thought essay and how to defend this essay with peer review and discussion. As my high school career proceeded, I grew as a writer and an intellectual. My junior year, I wrote and presented three PBATs, English, Science, and Math. It was a challenging year. I was taking AP US History, starting to think about the college process, writing three of my graduation requirements, and dealing with personal issues of my own. However, I knew I was prepared to face all my responsibilities. My three papers were about three distinct topics, dystopian literature and patriarchy, physics and warfare, and statistics and school policing. After presenting my three papers and passing, I felt more secure with, in my education. I knew I actually understood what I had learned in each class and that I can apply it to real world experiences. This is where I find that standardized tests such as the regions fail as students. At PrEP, I was taught in a way that in, which ensured that I understood the topic and allowed for my own interpretation, rather than a system that forces us to cram and regurgitate what we can onto a test that eventually determines if we're fit to graduate from the high school program. After writing and presenting my final paper for history, focusing on the death penalty, I knew I was prepared as a writer and student to move on to college. I recently submitted my first, my first draft for my first college paper. My professor gave us a prompt, the MLA format requirement, and no rubric. And with little guidance, I applied the writing skills I learned at prep and submitted the draft. At the end of last week, my, prof my professor sent me my edits and included a message. This is a strong, vividly embodied, and committed first draft. My comments have marked local areas where sense and structure can be smoothed out and generalities can be deepened. Two, I have marked all how you can, wi can widen the angle on your conclusion. But overall, you're well on your way toward a final draft and unified narrative voice. Well done. It is safe to say that I was successful in my first draft because of the education I received at Humanities Preparatory Academy and the focus on educating students and preparing them for both discussions and writing in college rather than preparation for a test. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Brian Pimentel. I am a senior at Humanities Preparatory Academy 
Isco, and Chelsea. Before coming to Humanities Prep, I used to be at a Regents Bilingual School. When, when I first started my freshman year in that school, we didn't get to do icebreaker games or get to know each other. Instead, we started doing work based on getting us ready for the Regents exams. Personally, I'm not good at taking tests and would always fail every test or quiz. I was worried that I was not going to do good in the Regents and not graduate on time. But when I found out about a non-region school that only takes PVATs, I was amazed because I'm not a good test taker. And for me, PVATs were, gonna, were, going, um, PVATs were going to be better. I was grateful that a school like Humanities Preparatory Academy helped me be a better person and a better write, writer while preparing me for college. I feel that PBADS are a superior system because once I head to college, I will already know how to write a, how to write a paper. I don't remember any of the region's exams that I have taken. I felt pressured training myself to master multiple choice questions. The PBADS helped me learn more vocabulary and how to read and write at a higher lev level. I also got to analyze problems and ideas instead of just memorizing. Hello, my name is Cheyenne Pena and I'm a senior at Humanities Preparatory Academy. Today I'll be speaking about my experience with PBATS and my past history with standardized tests. As a student at PrEP, I'm confident that PBATS have made me a better writer. By increasing my writing stamina, improving my analytical skills, and allowing me to voice my opinions. Before in middle school, I was intimidated by writing. My hands would get, my hands would get sweaty, I'd get headaches, and a horrible feeling in my stomach. That not only extended to my writing, but also to tests in general. The thought of having a cap on how much work I had to do in one sitting was unbearable. Once I finished with the multiple choice answers and the short answers, I was left with a cramped, clammy, and hand and a three to four page and three to four pages of empty space to write an essay. I wasn't always the best test, test taker, but I tried my best and I felt that that was enough, or so I thought. When I get those tests back, I was disappointed in myself for not getting as high as my peers and was ultimately embarrassed. I questioned if I was an, as intelligent as I thought I was and if school was meant for me. The teachers told us that it took practice, but it felt as though every time we took a test, I was doomed from the start. So I told myself that I would never take a test again and apply to Humanities Preparatory Academy. However, when I got to prep, I found out about PBATS. Again, that nervous, nauseating feeling came back. I was only a freshman, but the anxiety of tests still filled me up. When I reached my junior year, I figured it was best to take PBATS head on. I stayed in during lunch and after school to work on PBATS. I was frustrated but still motivated because after all, I had three more to do. So I worked hard on my paper, constantly asking my teacher for help. When I was done, I felt like I had a weight off my shoulders and also found a new sense of confidence in myself. I was able to write an 11 to 15 page paper with convincing evidence, proper citations, and analysis. For my first PBAT, I got a four on my presentation and a 3.5 on my paper. I was elated and happy to be done with one PBAT. Coming out of the, that experience was stressful, considering my test stress and my thinking that I was unable to write. But looking back at it, it was one of my best moments. I came to the realization that it wasn't that I couldn't write. It was the fear that was instilled in my head from middle school that tests were the only thing that mattered. Those experiences of staying in a room for three hours with two number two pencils, a calculator, with built up anxiety, and not having the ability to stay still, stayed with me until I was a junior in high school. PBAC courses and teachers taught me that I am more than test scores, more than my fears, and that I am more than capable. That following, sun, that following summer of my junior year, I signed up for a summer immersion program called Columbia Freedom and Citizenship. There I would be reading some material from philosophers, writing daily responses to what we had read. Then later, sorry. 
Then later in the year, we would create a project calling attention to um, a social issue. The same feeling of anxiety came over me, but I was able to soothe it. I told myself, you've already written, a three, you've already written three, pages, three papers that were up to 20 pages. What is what a one-page res response to a 20-page paper? So I did the one-page response every night. I was able to analyze difficult content from Socrates, John Locke, John Hobbes, and others. And met. I was able to connect their ideas and make connections with present day life. I was able to form a sound argument and stand up for my ideas. While everyone was complaining about the whole ordeal, I was okay. I felt peace because I knew that I could do it, and I did. Now, whenever there is a paper due at school or writing samples are due for college, I can do it because of PBATS. Tests and writing no longer make me afraid. I'm confident in the work that I do. Most of all, I feel prepared for college more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Luca Coelho. Um, I'm currently a senior at Humanities Preparatory Academy. And I moved from Brazil actually not a long time ago. Um, I came during the second semester of freshman year. So I was new to that whole PBET experience. Um, I grew up in an education system where tests are the main form of providing how much people know about a certain subject. Um, therefore, all of me and um, all me and my classmates would do is try to memorize and somewhere understand the subject and prepare for those tests. And ironically, memorizing slash remembering is considered the lowest level of thinking. For the past hundred years, we have been using the same way to test people's knowledge based on how well they remember rather than deeply analyze their capability to create, evaluate, and apply their understanding into a piece of work. I always questioned why do colleges always ask for a graded written assignment, and why are so many of them going test optional and requiring more written creations? Well, because I guess times are changing and so are our minds. Our goal isn't to prepare students to follow orders and turn into robots working at factories anymore. Our goal is to show them how they can improve their critical thinking, problem solving, and creativity. And PBATs require a lot more effort from your whole brain than regular tests, I would say. Um, I would like to use example, um, as the math PBAT is a pretty good one. In tests, you have to use uh, formulas that you were taught to remember under time pressure to see if you can get the answers right. While in a math PBAT, you were meant to explain why you would use search formula and what the formula actually means. And part of the rubric says, make sure to include proof, reasoning, and analysis. Most of the time, you can either create your own formulas and reach for many different branches of a single concept just by simply taking your time to dig into it. The second and last step of a PBAT is to present it. Teachers will be able to brainstorm with the students and get a more in-depth perspective about what is great and what it isn't about their work, giving them feedback that could be used for future experiences rather than just a grade in the form of a number. Having test taking skills is definitely not a bad thing, but I would argue that having wider and more developed methods of thinking would prepare you for a better future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> um, all right. Transferring to a PBAS school was a breath of fresh air after being in a region's focused school. Teachers in a region school seem more focused on improving test scores than on students' learning. We memorized m material that the teacher knew the test would ask. Students, oh, schools like that kill the fun in learning. A student can only stay interested for so long when, when even the teacher is bored because they've been repeating themselves for the past decade. That's why teens don't do homework, skip class, and drop out. The school system is not tailored to the children of today. It is rare to see the passion or nurturing care found in a PBAS school teacher and a seasoned regents teacher. In a consortium school, we learn about current issues, law, and world events. Let me tell you about a real life situation that happened to me and how being in a PBAS school was important. I've had courses where I've learned research skills, how to gather evidence, and how to express my ideas. I was able to express these, I was able to use these experiences to solve a serious problem. In April of 2018, my family, which was living in the Bronx, was relocated by New York City's Department of Homeless Services to Patterson, New Jersey, as a part of a program of what 
the city called stable housing. There were many problems with the conditions of the apartment, but we, we didn't have too much choice. In May of this year, my mom received a tenancy summons saying that since she hadn't paid the rent for one month, she had to appear in court. Although our rent was supposed to be covered by NYC, something had gone wrong, and we were scared. We thought we might be evicted. I remember thinking I should try to help my family, but this is the sort of problem that deals with like legal stuff, and legal rhetoric is complicated, and deciphering that jargon is difficult. Then I remember the course I took called Constitutional Law. One of the teachers was a lawyer, and it helped me understand more of the legal world. Every class, we'd analyze a case and individually, analyze a case individually, and then come together to discuss it. We debate and have some homework on the topic. Pairing research skills that I had learned in another course called English Foundations with the legal rhetoric, I found fundamental laws that the landlord, a property company, had violated. I even found that there are YouTube videos describing legal ideas. Another great help was the contact my school helped me get with a housing lawyer who helped me find my footing. When, I came, oh, when the day came, for my mom to go to court, I went with her. My mom wasn't clear about the, what the focus should be, and I was able to help keep the discussion on track. The results were positive. This experience uh, showed me that my PBAT education was preparatory for life. Yes, we write papers and take courses, but the way PBATs work, you learn how to present your ideas, topics, um, when topics become something you care about. And you also learn how to stick up for yourself and know when to ask for help. I believe PBAS schools teach you lifelong skills. Thank you. You know, if there was a, I could just drop the mic for all of you right now. Uh, <laughs> this is extraordinary. First of all, I want to, it's usually decorum not to do clapping in this room, but I want to just applaud these amazing students here for, for their amazing testimony. Um, uh, just some quick follow-up questions to this amazing panel. Um, a question I ask the students at Leaders in my district is a question I like to ask the students here as well. How did you hear about consortium school, uh, who was the first person to tell you about it? How did you hear about it? And feel free, anyone could just get to the mic. So when I arrived at Humanities Prep as a freshman, I had no idea it was a consortium <laughs> school. <laughs> right. I had heard of similar schools like Beacon High School, which is pretty well known around the city. And I was actually, in my middle school, I was discouraged to apply to Humanities Preparatory Academy because it seemed too far-fetched for people from my district. So I was suggested to apply to like a vocational school in Queens. Rather Who suggested than that? My um, school counselor in middle school. From a non-consortium yeah. school suggested to do that. Okay. Yeah. She was like, oh, these schools are really hard to get into. It's really far-fetched to think that you like to even apply and like risk not getting in. So you should apply to these schools instead. And then with the, after discussions with the principal and my mom, I went ahead and applied to Humanities Preparatory Academy and Good gratefully got in. Good for you. Uh, please, I want to hear from her. Um, <coughs> uh, I really love my story about how I found my PBAS school because, yeah, I didn't know PBAS schools existed. And the main thing on everyone's plate was like, oh, like audition for one of the big name brand schools. And um, I didn't believe that like my art and my skills of that nature were that good. so. It was like the last night of me, like the night right before they were taking the high school application papers, I was doing, um, I was filling it out. And it was like, I was looking for art school that didn't have like an audition, what's this called? Like, yeah, you didn't need to audition. So that was Gotham Professional Arts Academy, which is my first PBAS school. And yeah, I didn't know either, or I didn't know at all but I fell in love with um, how the school was ran. And so much so when I transferred to a region school and saw that it was run differently, I was ready to drop out. That's how bad it was. So I had to go back to another region school, which is um, Urban Academy presently. 
But yeah, I didn't know. I was just um, looking for a school without an audition. So you found it on your own. Interesting. Next. Uh, yeah. Just yeah, how'd you find it? Who told you about it? So after I was done with my freshman year in my old school, I went back to the enrollment center because I didn't like the environment in my old school. But then they gave me a huge list of schools to look at. And then he told me that there was like consortium schools, which I didn't know what they were back then. And then he gave me two, Humanities Prep and James Baldwin. So I'm like, I'll try out Humanities Prep. And then when I found out that it was a non-region school, I was actually glad that Humanities Prep got to take me in. I was like actually grateful because I actually learned more like through writing and through public speaking also. So yeah, I felt like if I stayed at a region school, I wouldn't learn as much as I do now. And I'm actually really grateful for that. Thank you. Um, in my case, like since I had just come from a different country, um, it's pretty hard to accept a student in the middle of the year, especially not having English as a first language. Right. So I had the high school book and I basically wrote down about like 10 names and we called every single school and nine out of those 10 were region schools, but I didn't really know about any of that. So, but the only school that actually opened their arms and said, yes, you can come in was a non-region school and that was Humanities Prep. Interesting. And no, yeah. Interesting. Um, I first found out about Humanities Prep when I was looking through the high school um, directory. Book. Yeah, right. high school directory when I was in eighth grade. And I applied to, I think, 12 schools, like the normal amount. And Humanities Prep was my fifth choice. I didn't think I was going to get into it. I didn't really want to go to it. And <laughs> <laughs> Keep like, it real. <laughs> and when I found out, I was kind of upset. But then when I arrived at the school and they told me that they'd have regions, I was like, oh, this is different. OK, this sounds better. And then after. Looking back on it, I'm actually really happy. If there's such thing as fate, I think fate had it, that I was supposed to go to this school. Interesting. I'm learning quite a bit because a lot of the answers I heard today were the answers I heard in my visit to leaders as well. Uh, it's sometimes just happened by chance. Some student just did some research on their own, a lack of guidance from the system to educate you about the, op the opportunities and the options. Um, last question for the students, and I like to kind of hear, because uh, I also asked this question, how did you explain to your, you know, your, your folks at home uh, about a, a, a school that does not administer the regents? Because a question that came up in my visit was some parents were saying, what do you mean there's no regents? How do they objectively assess your performance? That sounds crazy. How did you, did you get that at home? And how do you deal with, how did you deal with that? So I come, I'm the youngest of three, so both of my older siblings went to New York City Public High Schools and they were distraught when they found out that Humanities Prep didn't do Regents and it's, everything seemed kind of foreign. But it was something that I only had to deal with in my junior and senior year, so we went along with it. And then as they like looked over my schoolwork and proofread all my essays, they're like, wow, this is really like excelled writing for somebody who's a freshman and a sophomore in high school. So once I did reach the junior year, like threshold and started writing my actual PBATs and got ready to present, they understood why it was an alternative to regions. And they s understand like the whole test anxiety. So they, they supported me full fledged. And my siblings definitely did help me edit my papers. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yes. Um, in my case, it was um, different because my parents didn't really know what the word regents meant, but they were surprised that there was no main test to make sure I passed to the next level. Um, but after I explained it and explained why we do it, they were actually fine with it, completely fine with it. Great. Um, I remember that my mother, she was very suspicious. She was like, what do you mean they don't have tests? Are you lying to me? And she didn't understand. Understandable question, yeah. <laughs> and my brother, too, he was like, you're lying. No, because he goes to a region school. And so he was like, no, that's not true. And I'm like, no, it is true. And it was weird because he would get out of school June 26th, and I, w and I would get out, like, two weeks earlier because I didn't have to take PBATs. And, like, my 
freshman and sophomore year. So I had all this free time. And he was like, no, that's not fair. And then when I actually got time to writing, my mom was like, oh, okay, I see. Because it was like vigorous writing every single day. Like, me, like I can't talk right now. I have to write. I have to write. And then she's like, okay. And then she understood like what the school was about. Fascinating. Yes, do you want to? So my, my mom felt was like, oh, you're going to a PBAS school? She was like, I'm like, for me, for my mom, she was like, oh, you're not taking regions. And I'm like, no, because she knew, like, me as, um, I have an IEP, so, like, I'm not good at taking tests. Like, I noticed since I was in third grade, because I had trouble taking tests always. So, she knew that that school would be a perfect fit for me. Like, she support me, and then she's seen, like, how much I've improved throughout this whole year. Like, especially now that I'm a senior, she's, she's seen, like, how much I've accomplished, like, writing papers. And, like, she's actually been, like, proud of that because I've been, like, not writing that much as I used to, so. Extraordinary uh, stories. And question for the principal. Uh, thank you, by the way. Very powerful opening, which I took some notes on. Um, how do you respond? Like, what are your general thoughts? You heard me earlier exchange with the administration. I was very active in my school community. Mm -hmm. I attended many PDs. I was a member of my SLT. I never heard of consortium schools when I was a teacher. I would have loved to have learned some of the amazing practices that can be applied even in a non-consortium school. Do you get opportunities to speak with your peers beyond the consortium network? Does the DOE foster that environment where you collaborate beyond the 38 or just the consortium network? Because I would have loved to have learned some of these amazing practices that happens obviously here in consortium schools. Um, so I've been principal for, this is my eighth year, but I've been a, uh, a teacher for 10 before that. So a long time I've seen the kind of arc of the DOE and the state kind right. of there are different right. relationships depending on who the mayor is. And um, so whenever you're doing radical uh, work that is somewhat subversive and not what other people are doing, people want to stop you. Uh, sometimes it's a state, sometimes it's been the city. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, we're in a unique opportunity right now where both the city and state uh, are open to this, this model of instruction where parents and students are exhausted by the testing culture. Uh, and we have an opportunity for real change. Um, you know, we've, what I, I say that to say that sometimes we've had to float under the radar. Uh, just because, you know, if, people, if, you're on, if you're heavy on the radar, people try to stop what you're doing. Uh, now we feel we can come out and, you know, announce who we are, at least I do. This is my perspective. I don't represent the entire consortium. Um, and um, the DOE, would, you know, does foster opportunities for learning, and uh, it, it hasn't necessarily, um, not any fault of their own. I think they're learning about us. Um, 20 years? <laughs> it, you know, it's, there's a lot we of change, We are lifelong though. learners, yes. <laughs> there's a different mayors, you know, at, at all different... Yes, uh, I and, hear you. And they have to kind of relearn the system, you know. Um, so I think that um, we will have opportunities to be able to show the work that we're doing and showcase it. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, we, nationally, uh, we've had, and internationally, we've had visitors from all over different countries. We had someone from Australia, a team of educators from Australia, from Canada, from the Netherlands in the last few years, uh, all over the world that come and visit our school and learn about our practices. Nationally, we've been part of a group of all kinds of schools uh, that do similar things. Um, and they visited us, we visited them, we trained them in restorative justice. Consortium schools were doing restorative justice in the 90s. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a safe and comfortable environment to share what we do now. And your admissions, tell us about your admissions process. Um, so it's, ours is unusual because we're split. Uh, so the ninth graders have to go through that horrible, uh, you know, the eighth graders go through that horrible process. If you're a parent, you know what it's like, where you have to, um, you know, apply to the schools and everyone has a standardized rubric and, you know, they, they apply and then, you know, they get sorted and they either get seats or they don't. But we take nine, we get transfer students from all four grades, uh, no age limits, nothing. Um, and no, requi no testing requirements. So I can't even tell you, we have transfer students from all different kinds of situations. Some of them, like Luca, have coming from a new country, don't have a placement. Uh, some of them have uh, really struggled, like, uh, like Brian, in a testing culture. 
Um, some of them, uh, you know, we have students who are trans transitioning from incarceration. We have students who are, uh, you know, for them, you know, it's like, wow, this is amazing. Um, you know, we have students who um, have left the system, are in temporary housing, need a placement. We just had a student, well, I won't say this, but, you know, in the past we've had students come in from different temporary housing situations. Um, it's, there's no one type of transfer student, but uh, they, the admissions process is, uh, enrollment will often send us kids, sometimes guidance counselors, advocates for children, different children advocates groups in the city. Uh, they'll show up in our office, we'll meet with them, we'll assess their needs if we have space for them and we'll talk about them. So to be clear, you welcome all. Yeah. Is that, is that right? Yeah. You welcome all. Mm -hmm. You meet students where they're at. Yes. And you are building a school culture around their strengths and their abilities and you're still meeting standards along the way. Is that correct? Absolutely. <laughs> For the public, <laughs> that's paying attention, because that's really important. Um, and your graduation rates, if you could speak to that, some of the metrics that they use. Um, this, uh, the one that just came out for this past year was 94%, um, which is a lot higher than uh, and uh, I think it was um, our, our six-month college, uh, uh, I don't know what they call it, but the kids who six months after graduation are in college is 83%. 94%. Um, and how are uh, key subgroups, students with IEPs, multilingual learners, how are they um, doing? So uh, students, uh, students with um, our English language learners, I think they were had a higher graduation rate than our, um, for some reason, than the rest of our, you know, our, our <laughs> normal number of students. Um, we, uh, are, are, uh, we do very well with our population of black and Hispanic males, much, I think it's 20 or 30 percent higher than the citywide average, their graduation rate. Um, and uh, IEP students, I can't, I'd have to get back to you on that because I just got that report. No worries. And yeah. if anyone, I know many folks here might know, but if anyone in the public that's paying attention, if, you're, if, if, if the word, if the term PBAT is new, to, it was new to me. I, I, I copied one of the rubrics for the presentations. Check it out. Before anyone passes judgment that it's a watered down version of education, it is far more rigorous than any New York State Regents exams. Take that to the bank. As someone who taught Regents classes for a number of years, what these kids are doing is far more rigorous, complex, and actually meaningful than the Regents. Um, it is, it is not simple, but it's also not a surprise or a gotcha game, mm -hmm. and you're always in it together. Um, and one of the things I, I, I'll leave you with is that when I visit schools, uh, and I always encourage the DOE to do the same, because I, I, I can't say when they send their central folks in about test scores, rather than ask schools about test scores, what kinds of problems are our students tackling? You know, you, look, I, I, I was never a great calculus uh, student. I was not great in t tests in certain areas as well. But you know what? All of you are amazing problem solvers. Mm. And in this world today, in this country today, we need you more than ever. You are so much more than a score. Thank you very much. Appreciate you all. You. Next, we'll hear from Emily. Uh, Karazana, uh, Ann Cook, who is an extraordinary person, uh, Jonathan uh, Katz, uh, Tesfia Rachman, Ashley Grant, and uh, Belinda Wynn. And uh, I think there, there's a clock, I think, for three minutes. Whenever folks are ready, you, you, you may begin.
Good afternoon. My name is Mylinda Lee, and in three minutes, I'm going to describe the whole world of border education to me. I have a daughter, 23 years old, with Down syndrome. I have advocated on behalf of my child since before she was born. They told me to terminate her, so that was the first test. She's now 23 years old, attending BMCC in a Rigidio program. I say no to the board of education with the advocacy that I have had to endure persistently to get her an appropriate education, to have an impartial hearing on seven occasions, to actually get a compensatory order. I say no to regents, and the reason being, my son is 15 years old, attending a charter school where they do nothing but testing. They don't have a life other than testing, testing. They are failed on purpose, but then they pass the regions. The rhetoric, as the Board of Education says, they come to kids where they are, they don't. This whole myth of 25 years or we're gonna meet them where they are, they're not. I am 57 years old, I have just as much as Down syndrome me as my daughter. The Board of Education, I don't know where they came from, but they sat behind a table and they decided that they were gonna take special needs and put them in a bubble with all this money. But what they didn't do was to release our children so that they can be their best self. Meet me where I am and let me be who I am. Not a Regents, not a CPAP or all these other entities, SSVR. You have so many different resources that you're supposed to align your kids with that they're able to obtain. My daughter may never be the president. She may never drive a car. I myself will never be the president or drive a car. I'm retired from New York, City, New York City Transit as a station agent for over 17 and a half years. I came here today because on behalf of every individual with intellectual disability, there has to be another pathway. You cannot give a child a certificate, a certificate that says you have completed. My daughter has attended over 21 years of school. I took her to SSVR, they told me, oh, go get her GED. I took her to HRC supportive um, employment because she was diagnosed to need supportive employment. My daughter has an income of over $500 a month. She receives $15 in SNAP benefits. In this real world, what we live in, in New York City, what is that? My child is able to read, write, get on a computer better than me, has more common sense and will help anybody. Our system today, amongst all of us, we have to make them stop. This is not the norm. To stand here today, I am privileged and I am blessed. But as an advocate, you get tired. Fighting and fighting and fighting, I am that story. I came from a mom of seven. I have a 33-year-old that just got 33 credits, or three, three years of credits incarcerated. I have a daughter, 25 years old, cancer survivor, got an alternative th a diploma. So I'm gonna finish my statement with this. Please revise the way that we test our kids, please give them their life that they deserve. Please allow them to be who they are and go where they need to be. Because I am somebody and I have special needs. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Ashley Grant and I'm an attorney at Advocates for Children. I also coordinate the statewide coalition on multiple pathways to a diploma. So on behalf of the commission, I mean, on behalf of the coalition, I thank you for the opportunity to speak about high stakes tests and the need for more ways to determine that students have mastered graduation standards. Our coalition of more than 70 members includes advocates, educators, parents, and youth, and we represent a broad cross section of students, including students with disabilities, multilingual learners, and economically disadvantaged young people. For more than 12 years, we've come together to urge New York State to create multiple instructional and assessment pathways to a high school diploma, each of which holds all students to high expectations, provides them with quality instruction, and opens the door to career and post-secondary opportunities. We are also united by the concern that access to existing graduation pathways, like career and technical ed, or CTE, and work-based learning opportunities that have been shown to improve student engagement, reduce dropout rates, and improve college completion rates. These opportunities have been limited for many students. So I'm attaching to my written remarks a, a copy of our co coalition's full policy goals. New York students need pathways to a diploma that do not rely on high stakes exams. 
as has been said before, to earn a diploma in our state, students must generally pass five Regents exams or substitute other types of high stakes exams in those subject areas. But research shows that high stakes tests are poor indicators of student readiness and that locally determined measures like GPA better predict how students will do in college. High stakes tests also disproportionately create barriers for students with disabilities, multi-language learners, and for students of color. So as um, the council member has shared, New York is one of only 11 states that maintains exit exam requirements. And with requirements that students pass five exams, we have some of the most burdensome in the country. So it's really time for New York to catch up with the rest of the country and to find ways to demonstrate that students are ready for college and career without passing, forcing them to pass these high stakes tests. The state's current graduation requirements create a barrier to opportunities who, for students who are already ready um, to graduate and move on to the next phase of their lives. So take, for example, an English language learner in foster care who Advocates for Children assisted, and who I'm gonna call Myra. Myra is very bright. She earned more than 50 credits, far exceeding the coursework required for a Regents diploma. Myra did well in her classes, and she maintained a B average, but she struggled to pass the Regents exam in English language arts. After completing all of her other graduation requirements at age 19, Rather than going on to college, Myra had to spend two more years studying for and retaking the English language arts exam. Eventually, after taking that single exam seven times, she finally passed at the age of 21. She eventually went on to college and she did well. But if she had been able to show her mastery of those English language arts standards another way, through a performance-based assessment, through her coursework, through a capstone project, she could have spent those two years working toward her college degree rather than retaking a single test. Um, our coalition is very pleased that the New York City Council and the New York State Board of Regents and the New York State Edu Department, Education Department are all considering other ways in which students like Myra could show that they're ready to graduate. And we strongly urge New York State to create pathways to graduation that don't rely on high stakes tests. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions. A lot, a lot of good stuff today. Yeah. <laughs> Well, a lot of the issues that um, are in the st printed statement are, have been dealt with, I think, very adequately. There are a few things I'd like to just kind of emphasize. Um, one is that uh, it's, you know, I think it's wrong to think about an assessment system as, as the be all and end all. It's what the assessment system creates for teachers. And I think that what you heard today from the kids and from other people is that that's really the issue that you know you need some way of allowing teachers to really teach and be professional form professional communities which is I think one of the things that is built into what the consortium is trying to do um, so I think just to kind of really emphasize that and I want to thank you very much for raising a lot of the really critical issues that I think are, are really at issue here um, we have been in existence, as you said, for more than 20 years. We've seen uh, something like six chancellors come and go, uh, five state commissioners come and go, and, and most of them have been, I would say, less than enthusiastic about what we're trying to do. Um, I think that there is a change, uh, at least at the state level. I think people are starting to ask questions about what is it that we expect, what do we want kids to be able to do when they leave high school? Um, I, I would like to see the department be, uh, as you were sort of indicating, more open about the opportunities that exist for kids. I think it would be very valuable for the city to be, as the biggest district in the state, to really be able to, to uh, present to the, to, the, to the regents and to the state ed department a very solid case for why the state should move away from coupling graduation with the tests, and also why they shouldn't really open it up. ESSA provides an opportunity to design a different way of doing assessment in every state. And New York, under the previous commissioner, did not want to participate in that. I think that that was a, a very large mistake. And I hope that it's something that we can uh, begin to think about in the future. Oh, the other thing, point that I, I would like to, um, to just mention is that it, you know, it's not only the kids that get affected by this, it's also the teachers. And um, you know, one of the teachers said something to the effect that it, it, it's no doubt that it's made me a better teacher, more knowledgeable, more engaged, and more enthusiastic. What more can you ask? I mean, that is what you want professionals to be able to feel about 
what they're doing when they're working with kids. Uh, people have asked, what does it mean it's a system? Because we talk about it as a system. And I guess there are sort of four things that are very important to us. One is that it's a pedagogy based on inquiry, teaching, and in-depth learning. And it's a respect for the diversity of ideas and experiences, high expectations for all students, and a value of community and collaboration. And I think that one of the things that, we're, that people ask a lot, you've asked a lot about, what are the byproducts of this? What, in what ways has this affected the system? Um, one of the ways that I think is particularly important is a pilot that we ran with CUNY. And because what we discovered was when we pulled all our college admissions people together, they said, you know, our kids are getting into private colleges, they're getting into state universities, they're not getting into the CUNY four-year colleges. And uh, we then went to CUNY, we designed a, a pilot. That pilot has been running for four years. That we, over 400 kids have now gotten into CUNY, into the CUNY four-year colleges that would not have gotten in before because the, we shifted the admissions from test scores to looking at their G GPA and looking at their PBATs. So, and that's affected CUNY because they've now changed the way they do admissions. They're more open to recommendations. They're more open to looking at student work. Um, and it's also moved them away from remediation uh, because we've been able to, and Dr. Katz will talk about this, we've been able to get kids into the freshman level math classes without doing the remediation and they've succeeded. So I think we've had an effect on, for all the kids in New York City, on kind of convincing CUNY that there are other ways of looking at, at student admission. That's, that's one thing. And there are other things. There's an LGBTQ curriculum that was out that the, the department actually uh, you know, knows about and we put that on online. Uh, there are things like prose, which is one of the critical areas that teachers in the, uh, the UFT got involved in, which was really the push for that came from the consortium. Those are things that, there, there are many things that we've been able to kind of suggest college preparatory courses uh, that we started way before they started AP for All. And I was very interested in the data on AP for All. I think it's very important to find out how much money is being spent on that and how many kids are actually using those credits and getting credit for that. Because these teachers feel in competition with that, that they're, they have college ready courses, college preparatory courses that they would like to teach and, be, uh, and have credit for that for the school. So I think it's something that the department needs to really think again about how they're doing that. So um, the finally, I would say that one of the critical things is, is this for all kids? And I think um, it is for all kids. It's particularly relevant because one of the critical issues in teaching this way is discussion. And I think that um, I just want to read one observation by a student about coming to a school where discussion was really valued. Um, he says, the school I came from before this one, which was a very competitive school with all college-bound students, was not a very diverse environment. So there weren't too many opportunities to hear ideas from kids who came from really different backgrounds and neighborhoods. It wasn't a place where your ideas really mattered in classes. Discussions were pretty predictable, leading to specific answers that we knew the teacher wanted us to give. The first week I came here, I was in a class where students were having a lively discussion about the behavior of people during the Great Depression. And I hear a white girl, someone with dyed red hair, make a controversial point. I'm sitting there thinking, wow, I, I agree with her. I didn't expect someone like her to say that. And the next person who speaks is a black guy in a hoodie. And he's agreeing with her. That was a very important moment for me because I suddenly realized that in this school, in this class, in this discussion, kids could learn from one another, from what others say. School wasn't just a social place, it was academic. You could agree with kids and share something uncommon. The hoodie guy and the dyed redhead could agree on a topic. People who were not like one another could agree on a point. And the teacher could listen to the points being made without judging. And it seems to me that's really the essence of what you're trying to create as an environment where kids feel that that is something that is to be respected and, and honored. So I think uh, the question about what we do next and how we move things along, 
Uh, I would like to see, uh, I, I think parents are looking for something to opt into, and I think that this is an opportunity. Parents in the city who go to private schools are able to choose schools with a particular pedagogical perspective, and I think that could happen in our schools, that not everybody wants to do performance assessment, but those schools that want to do it and where parents should know about it, should know that those opportunities exist, and I think the DOE should advocate on behalf of those parents and kids to persuade the regents to expand the number of schools that are covered by the consortium. No, I, I have to applaud her. Uh, your name was referenced during the exchange with the administration is that schools interested in joining the consortium are told to refer to you. Um, is that correct? Say that again. I'm I was told by the administration when they testified earlier that if a school would like to join the consortium network, that they are referred to speak to the one and only Ann Cook. Is, 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 that, is that right? You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the issue is that the, the, state, the state put a number on the number of, they, they created a number that, that, of schools that could be in the consortium. And over the years, there were some schools on there that we had nothing to do with. Some of those schools got removed, and then we were able to put some schools in there because there was a number. I don't know where they came up with this number in the first place. Uh, you know, the, we go back, our origins go back to Tom Sobel, who was the commissioner in 1995, who was the originator of the waiver. And it's been passed by five different, unanimously by five different boards of regents to extend it. Um, I think that uh, they could extend it further. I think there's a tremendous amount of interest not only in the city but across the state for clusters of schools to come together, not necessarily under us, but uh, form the cons a consortium that would serve another group of schools. Uh, uh, it's not up to, it isn't up to the DOE except that the DOE could become a vocal supporter and advocate for the state to really take this on. So, so this is my, and I thank you for saying that because this is my point. I mean, I understand that this is the state's decision and I know the DOE kept punting to that, but we are the largest city in the state. We have the largest microphone in the state and we have folks here, including me, that's not shy to use the microphone. Where has there been, where is the advocacy? Where is, where is the movement? The only thing we heard uh, you know, from the mayor, as far as in the last uh, time they went out to Albany last year, was uh, you know mayoral control and the Shasat, and like there was no other conversation. Also about CFE, by the way, they owe us money. So I hear you, and you're absolutely uh, spot on. And the last question I'll have is that um, you heard my example before that I taught in the same zip code as leaders but I never had an opportunity to sit down with teachers from leaders to learn about some of the amazing practices happening there. Has anyone from DOE reached out to you or to, to the consortium you know, network to say, hey, you know, our schools might not have the waiver for the, from the regions, from the test, but you're doing some amazing things that we could still apply here. Has there, has there been any of that cross-departmental or am I asking too much? Has there been any, <laughs> you could be diplomatic. Well, I mean, I think, I think that um, when you hear from um, Jonathan Katz, I mean, one of the things that we've been um, interested in is how do, you, how do you work with math? You know, the cities um, had a struggle around math, for example. And uh, the state looks at the data and it's, awful. There are some schools that are trying to do some really different things and it would be, I think, helpful uh, for the department to start to listen to some, to bring some of these people together to talk about what are some of the things that they're finding. And there are veteran teachers out there who've had really uh, some interesting experiences who kind of take the temperature of their kids every year and Nobody asks them, what's, what's really happening in your schools? And I think what you're suggesting when you were in the classroom, how useful it would have been to have had 
an opportunity to share with other people. I think one of the things that we've discovered is that, that uh, we have something called exchanges, where we bring some of the consortium schools together around a subject discipline, and, and Jonathan will talk about that a little bit. Um, and that has proven to be one of the most effective teacher professional development strategies of bringing teachers together from different schools to grade student papers and do a moderation study so that the, 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 the instruments have reliability, coming together and talking about student work, having students, teachers come together around a discipline and talking about what are they trying to do in their classes and going to see each other teach. Those are things that I think um, could be scaled up. They're always talking about scaling up. And that is something that the system could be much more aggressive about, I think. The last thing I'll say, and I'll turn to the rest of the panel, is one thing they can do immediately without any waiver or application process, for example, at Leaders, which I know is unique to, to, to their outward bound model. It's not, it's not every consortium school does this, but this model of crew, which I find so interesting, because uh, my school where I went, I went to Murrow High School, we had like a homeroom, so to speak, um, but crew has an entire, almost like a period block out, which meets during the week. It's more than just five minutes of check-in attendance. They actually meet for a block uh, during the day. It's the same, this is every child, every student is assigned, and they meet pretty much across the week and throughout their entire school tenure. So that's your crew, that's your class, and it's the same crew teacher that mentor with you throughout your academic career. And every freshman is given uh, the opportunity to attend a, I think it's a school-sponsored trip yeah. to kind of, you know, I think it's a camping trip to build, you know, just camaraderie, support, trust, relationships. Um, and sometimes I worked in a large comprehensive high school and the challenge for us, how do you create a small learning community within such a large place? They're onto something there. You cre they created a small family within a large place. Um, and the students talked to me about less you know, incidents of bullying, less incidents of not knowing each other. They all knew each other. And they, during the PBAT season, which we kept hearing about, the students during, during the, the crew time were helping each other for their PBATs. And the teacher would be their support system as well. So I, they're, onto, they're, they're onto incredible things that I wish other folks can also could learn from and apply. So I, I thank you. Uh, Ms. Cook, for your leadership in so many different ways. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to applaud you. Uh, uh, next, I'm sorry. So I work with Anne, and I work with the consortium, and I do the math work. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So yeah, just make sure that you're speaking into the mic and, and also just uh, announce your name. Okay. okay. Uh, my name is Jonathan Katz. Uh, I've been involved in education for almost 40 years. 24 of those years as a middle and high school math teacher. And I, it has been a great privilege to have worked with thousands of New York City public school students and hundreds of teachers across the country. I've taught students who are required to take the math regents and students who had a waiver from the math regents. So I taught in the consortium in the 1990s when it became the consortium. I want to take this opportunity to describe the difference between these two experiences through the views of myself and the thoughts of a student. As I view the teaching and learning of mathematics, I believe we have two purposes in our work. One, students should come to appreciate the power and beauty of mathematics. And two, students should come to understand mathematical ideas with depth and nuance, and this will enable students to think mathematically. So how can we make this happen? Mathematics has both great simplicity and complexity. It can create frustration in a student's mind if they are not given time and opportunities to make sense of ideas and procedures that are presented to them. I stress the term time because that is a crucial difference when you are teaching towards an exam or when you are teaching for deep thinking and understanding. When you are asked to have students successfully understand a great deal of math content over a fairly short period of time, the learning will be superficial at best and non-existent 
at worst. Teachers often feel rushed to cover the material, while many students feel frustrated and angry and come to dislike this beautiful discipline of mathematics. How disappointing is that and how hurtful it is to both teachers and students. And we can see the results of this conundrum where the New York State math regents is scored on a scale where a passing grade of 65 is equivalent to less than 33% of the answers being correct. We make believe that students understand mathematics in this state. But I want to share a more hopeful story. In the New York Performance Standards Consortium, we believe in depth over breadth. Students spend three to four years grappling with problems, thinking about concepts and procedures with, with the major goal of having the students view mathematics as sensible and worthy of their time. As a culminating experience, students in our school will spend one to two months working on just one problem. Why would we do such a thing? Because that one problem takes on new meaning over time as a student keeps thinking about it. The problem becomes his or her vehicle to expressing their deepest mathematical thinking and understanding while learning new ideas and raising new questions about mathematics. And the young man who was sitting where I was, Luca, who I wish we, is that perfect example, he last year took on what is a famous Josephus problem written in the 1800s and did incredible investigating and thinking and going to new places for himself and incredibly interesting places. And so it's, he was just one example of wh what happens when a kid does this work. Uh, the problem becomes his or her vehicle to expressing their deepest in mathematical thinking and understanding while learning new ideas and raising new questions about mathematics. Students become independent thinkers and creators of original thoughts. Now that is not how we definitely think mathematics is thought about. You have original thoughts in mathematics? That's crazy. You're just answering questions and you're right or you're wrong. We don't look at it that way. Students write about their experiences with this problem along with the mathematical thinking and, and the ideas they use to try to make sense of the problem and find its solution. Through this endeavor, students are experiencing the work of a mathematician. This approach to teaching and learning prepares students to develop in-depth understanding that is required for students to, su to succeed in mathematics courses once they enroll in college. And this has been proven by what has happened in the pilot study because in one year, and I forget the numbers so I will be a little off, but 80 kids were accepted who had not met the certain criteria at that point, what is accepted, and over 90% passed a math course that was given, going to give them credit. It was not a uh, remedial course. And so 90% who didn't meet the requirements that they had passed the course that was that was a regular course, and that raised eyebrows for the people in CUNY. Uh, so that was that really supports the impact this kind of work has. I want to share words of, of a, an incredible young man from Gambia, and they call it the Gambia, so I should say the Gambia, who never studied mathematics in his country. He only went to Quran school in his country. So when he came to the United States two years ago, he never went to a math class and never had. He had some mathematics just by living and because he's an incredibly curious human being, but he wanted to come to this country because he wanted to learn math and left his family to do this. So he, he went to International Community High School, which is a consortium school. He was given a problem created by Zeno over 2,000 years ago. People have heard about Zeno's paradox, and there are four paradoxes. He took on one of them. Uh, and he wrote this in his, as he was doing his PBAT. 
Learning math at ICHS has helped me to think mathematically, learn how to think outside the box using different strategies. When I was given a problem, I had to think in new ways and research ideas I didn't know about. I have spent two months thinking about one problem, which we called a walk to the door. It led me to thinking about limits. Now, this is a person who's been only learning math for two years, and anyone who knows math, limits is a precursor to work you do in calculus. So, and I had to study fractions which he knew nothing about in order to be able to think about this problem. Through doing the problem, I got fascinated by the ideas of the infinite and the finite, and I was able to connect it to my life. The amount of math I know today as compared to when I came to this country is amazing. And I thank my teachers and ICHS for believing in and supporting me. This young man's experience is not unusual. Working on a PBAT changed the way he thought about math and thought about himself. And this has occurred for many students in, our, in the consortium schools. If we are real, willing to rethink what it means to teach and learn and have, and have the belief that all students can truly learn mathematics, we can see a dramatic change in the way students experience and talk about this subject. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Chair Traeger and members of the Committee on Education. My name is Tasfia Rahman and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, the nation's only pan-Asian children and family advocacy organization that leads the fight for improved and equitable policy systems, funding, and services to support those in need. The Asian Pacific American population comprises over 15% of New York City, yet their needs are, yet their needs are consistently overlooked misunderstood and uncounted. The Asian model minority myth masks the many challenges that marginalized APA students face in education. In New York City, our students often come from immigrant and low-income families, face language barriers, and are the first generation in their families to attend American schools and pursue higher education. And the perceived success of Asian students in education, particularly around testing, is consistently used, not only used as a reason to further marginalize students within the community, but also um, students from other disenfranchised communities. The monolithic view of the community is why we continue to advocate for the implementation of policies such as data disaggregation to better accurately represent the needs of APAs. Today, we will testify on how a single test culture negatively impacts APA students, despite the perceived notion of their success in testing. As an alternative, we advocate for utilizing a multiple measure model for assessing a student's academic progress, potential, and interest. In the case specifically, and the most relevant, um, New York City Special Ed High School's entrance exam, for APA families, when faced with the challenge of navigating a complex education system, a single test in comparison is seen as the least difficult barrier. Unfortunately, this misguided hope motivates many families, particularly limited English proficient APA parents vulnerable to spending money they do not have. Ultimately, a vast majority of Asian students in public schools do not attending, end up attending specialized high schools or other screen programs, despite the overinvestment in test prep. Our community should be able to explore and understand the variety of academic options available to their children. Language access and access to teachers would help ELL and new immigrant parents unfamiliar with the DOE system and opportunities rather than making them reliant on private tutoring centers that provide expensive in-language support, but that are incentivized to uphold a paying customer base who are prepping for the SHSAT and other high-stakes high exam. Teaching to a single test hurts our students at critical stages of childhood and adolescent development. Rigorous tutoring and exam prep often contribute to high levels of stress, isolation, and shame that young students do not, have, do not yet have the social skills to manage independently. It also diminishes the capacity to foster more holistic learning among all our youth. Further, the emphasis on high-stakes single tests sends a message that a student's worth, beginning as young as four years old, has already been defined by a single number, even before they enter the education system. This can foster lifelong unhealthy learning environments for many students that can have a negative impact on their mental health, learning abilities, and outcome. 
In advocating for a multiple measure model, we also caution the use of specific measures that are vulnerable to, ex to existing negative biases about APA students and other students of color. Finally, we commend the committees and the city's commitment to educational ac equity across our school system for all our students. We hope that at the very least, high stakes single tests that harm the social and emotional well-being of all of our students are eliminated. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for, uh, for your powerful words and um, I think further advancing uh, you know, the concern that about shortchanging education for many of our students. You just reminded me of an experience when I was teaching the Global History Regents class and I was able to get through World War I uh, and we would review over and over and over again the, tre the Treaty of Versailles. On the Regents, there was a question, which one of the following choices was not a provision of the Treaty of Versailles? Because we never covered or discussed the word provision, it threw off a number of my students. We usually describe it as terms, conditions of the treaty. But that one vocabulary word threw so many of them off and some of them left the question blank. Mm -hmm. Now I assure you those students know the Treaty of Versailles. We, we discussed it, we, I, I saw their work. That one question threw them off because of that one word. And so you just brought me back to that painful memory uh, during my teaching days. Thank you all. Uh, though, actually, we, we, still have to, we have to hear more, I'm sorry, but thank you for the powerful testimony. Please, next, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair Charger, for holding this important hearing and for always holding these marathon hearings, um, listening to all advocates, um, coining a term that was used in the first panel, we see you, and we very much so appreciate that. Uh, my name is Emily Carizana. I work at Class Size Matters. I attended elementary and middle school in the public system here in New York City, and I am here today in part to advocate for my younger self. Um, Beginning in the sixth grade, I would trek up to Bronx Science two to three times a week and spend my summers there. I was participating in a, the Dream Program, Specialized High School Institute. Um, and after many hours of sacrificed time out of my childhood learning math formulas and dissecting sentence structures at nauseum, I did not get into a single specialized high school. Um, and this is despite having high grades in my courses and performing well on the state exam. The entire premise of the program was to give prep to low-income, high-achieving students. And I was fortunate enough to be one of them, but not as fortunate as I thought I was. Uh, my parents, well-intentioned, first-generation immigrants, um, they didn't know how to navigate the bureaucratic system that is this complex admission systems in our high school admissions um, program in New York City. Um, so when I was rejected, they did the only thing that they thought they could do, um, and they uprooted my entire family, and we moved to neighboring New Jersey. Yeah. Um, and from there, I attended my town's public high school. I took AP courses, IB courses, did very well, went on to go to Rutgers University, earned my bachelor's degree in political science with a concentration in philosophy in three years. Um, my SAT results were no indication of where my ability stood back in eighth grade, just as they are not a valid marker for success for any student today. While many argue that eliminating the, this exam or the gifted and talented programs will cause the families of high achieving students to move out of the city, the example of my family shows how the opposite happens currently because of the use of an unfair high stakes exam, which has been shown not only to discriminate against students of color, but also high achieving girls. This is a portion of the discussion that has not been touched on. While nearly all the discussion has so far revolved around the clear racial disparities, this exam has also been shown conclusively to be highly gender biased. Though New York City girls receive higher test scores on the state exams and better grades, they are accepted into the specialized high schools at much lower rates. It is high time that we consider relying on more holistic factors when deciding on the policies that shape the life trajectories of our students. If we instead move to implement more gifted and talented programs and build, implement more specialized high schools, we'd be moving backwards and replicating the same damaging pro practices that have undermined educational opportunities in our schools. 
And I thank you for the opportunity. Wow. That's fun. <laughs> How do you follow some of this? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, and I am a believer that every single child, every single student is gifted and talented. I don't care what any test says. Right. Every, st every single student. If given the opportunity, students always excel. That, that, take that uh, to the bank. So I, I really do, uh, do appreciate that. I appreciate everyone's work. Until we have a lot of work to do. Um, but I appreciate the fact this has been a very rich conversation so far that has been it's sorely needed. Uh, and we need to educate the system that there are other pathways that are actually, I think, more... And the word alternative throws people off because they think it's some sort of less. No, it's actually more. We are denying kids this opportunity. And so thank you all for your incredible work and advocacy. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Okay, next panel. Uh, Robin, I believe Robin Broshi, uh, Michael uh, McKillen, McKillen uh, Peter Goodman, uh, Melinda Lee, Lori uh, Gumenau, uh, Kamala Carmen, and Michael Rothman. Whenever folks are ready, uh, they may begin. Okay. Um, my name is Robin Broshi. I am actually the parent of ninth and sixth graders at consortium schools, um, although that's not what brought me here, but I was delighted to hear the topic of the conversation. Ironically, they had to both submit uh, their respective uh, fourth and seventh grade state standardized test scores in order to be admitted into schools that are not gonna be using state standardized tests. Um, I've served as a member of the CEC for School District 2 in Manhattan for over five years and I formally served as its president for three years. Um, my children have taken every state assessment since third grade with varying degrees of personal stress on them and me and their principal. Um, and I, I do believe there is merit uh, some merit to standardized assessments to help districts and schools understand both their instructional strengths and the areas where they may need further development. Um, but of course, two days of testing is too much and the stakes remain much too high. And I think that current DOE policy around using the results of state assessments for selective school admissions contri contributes to the high stakes climate. In 2014, the New York State Legislature passed a revision to the state's education law, which I've attached to the back of my testimony, that mandated that New York State assessments could not account for the majority of a school's admissions criteria, resulting in the adjustment of many school admissions rubrics to reduce the role of state assessments to ensure compliance with the law. Um, however, my reading of the law is that it also mandates that the student scores on state administered ELA and math assessments for third and eighth grade may not be placed on a student's official transcript or maintained in a student's personal record. The law has language obligating districts to provide families with a clearly written notice that the results will not be part of a student's official transcript nor the student's permanent record and that the results are being provided to families for diagnostic purposes only. That's me paraphrasing the language in the law. And so I believe the DOE is not in compliance with that aspect of the law because they don't provide that information when they give parents test results. Further, the DOE then uses these student records, which I believe are out of compliance because they include state assessment outcomes, as part of the application process for selective school admissions without giving families an option to withhold scores on assessments that are not designed to be used for academic placement. Although families have the option to opt out of the assessments, the black box nature of selective admissions leaves them worried that the selective schools might not take their child might take their child's opt-out status into account. Additionally, confusion around the latest ESSA implementation in New York State leaves some families and even some school administrators I've spoken to 
with the misunderstanding that children who opt out will be assigned a one on their individual transcript. Earlier this month, I reached out to the Office of Enrollment on behalf of some families in School District 2 for guidance on how they may withhold their own child's uh, scores on their record during the application process, and I'm still awaiting feedback. Um, I'm not optimistic the DOE is going to share my interpretation with the law that would allow families to withhold these diagnostic assessment scores in the application process. To the extent that there are pedagogical merits to using thoughtfully designed standardized assessments, the current system of mandating that families provide their child's assessment results for the purpose of selective admissions increases pressures on teachers uh, to focus on test prep and incentivizes families to provide outside instruction to students in fourth and seventh grades, muddying the utility of the assessments for diagnostic purposes. Although working through changes in how assessments are designed does live at the state level, I believe it is within the DOE's power right now to change the high stakes climate around the assessments while also increasing their reliability by properly complying with the state law as it, as it is currently written. My name is Peter Goodman. I write a blog called Ed and the Apple, the Intersection of Education and Politics. I'm a CCNY cap on, I'm the president of the Education Alumni at City College. I attend all the Board of Regents meetings, so I've sort of made my life after retirement trying to change the galaxy one planet at a time. Um, I'll, I'll let me speak in three sections. First was Edustats, which we heard uh, of, uh, of the speaker from the Board of Ed, which to me is the Board of Ed interpretation of Hunger Games. Um, it's accountability on steroids. It is a terrible idea. As a teacher, we give tests for understanding every period. We teach something and we test whether the kids learned it or not. We do it through calling on kids in class, calling on non-volunteers, giving a quiz. We know what our kids don't know and don't know, and we constantly try to find some way of getting the kids to understand the concept. It's challenging, we have good days and bad days, good periods and bad periods, that's the nature of teaching. As we teach, we build a bigger toolkit. We have more ways of doing things. So when someone tells me some computer somewhere was gonna spin out numbers and is gonna tell me how to teach some kid, it's ludicrous. And I think it could be extremely dangerous because it could turn teachers off, it could turn the whole system into test and punish. So I have confidence that the city council and others will do what they can to bring some enlightenment to those people who are running, uh, the, running uh, the system. As far as the consortium schools, I've been involved with them since Eric Nadel Stern back in the 90s when it first started. I visited them many, many times. Anne has fought a war with various chancellors to keep the consortium uh, uh, going. Time and time again, it was challenged by those people in power. So I. I'm not so enthusiastic to rush to form more consortium schools because I fear the Department of Ed is gonna try to gobble them up. And if they gobble them up, they'll eat them. These are special schools. They require special teachers, special uh, school leaders. Only certain schools have the ability to change over. It's a totally different method of instruction. And I, I think what they do is absolutely wonderful, but I think we have to be careful that we don't rush to try to make every school a consortium school because that would not be a great idea. And lastly, uh, the Board of Regents. The Board of Regents is moving towards a two-year study, what they call graduation measures. And whether or not they keep the Regents is the end of the process. Are the 44 credits the, the proper credits? Is the curriculum the proper curriculum? Are we teaching kids so they can be are good college students and good employees. When the Blue Ribbon uh, panel gets started, there are gonna be people from the private sector. Do, uh, do the current graduates have the skills to work in this new age? Jobs are very different. So I think that it, it has to be done very carefully. There are going to be meetings in every borough that, and before the Blue Ribbon uh, 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 Commission starts, and we have to go, do, uh, go step by step because we don't know 
where the end is going to be. And I'm, I always say that one size fits all, fits no one. There's no reason why there has to be one system for everybody. Some schools can go one direction, some schools can go a different direction. In New York City, I think we should have pilots, lots of pilots, trying out something. Uh, there are wonderful schools that have stayed under the radar. There's been Hatton Day and Night Comprehensive High School. It's a great high school. Nobody knows about it. When I spoke with the principal, I said, do you want to spread it throughout the, uh, 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 the city? He said, absolutely not. What we do is great, but I'm afraid that if we try to spread it, they'll destroy it. So we can have many different models because we have so many different types of kids. And, and in fact, in the closing, I'll give you a, a job that I think is totally appropriate. I think instead of the current 32 school districts, there should be 51 school districts and they should be coterminous with city council members. Every city council member should have schools which they own because then they could really work with those schools and what happens in different parts of the city is gonna be different because kids are different and parents are different and the city is different. I thank you. As long as the members don't draw the districts, right? <laughs> uh, very powerful. Uh, and also just to be clear, I certainly not suggesting that every school become a consortium, but my goodness, they are doing some great things that I am jealous I didn't know about when I was teaching that we could have applied um, some, some uh, Another small thing they do, which I'm so uh, proud of, they, they have a whole event around celebrating students, I call it marching to the mailbox to celebrate their college application. I love that. They celebrate these types of occasions. And so for us, I was always taught share best practices and I'd love to learn more. So thank you so much for your, for your great, uh, great words. Appreciate it. Uh, next, sorry. I'm Mike McQuillan. I'm proud to represent- Is the mic on? Is the microphone on? Make sure that the red light, yeah. Thank you. I'm Mike McQuillan. Thank you. I'm still Mike McQuillan. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm proud to represent Leaders High School in your district, in your consortium. And I've come here from teaching 18 years of history in Brooklyn High Schools to support your initiative and to share why that matters to those who don't know it. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln traveled for six hours by stagecoach, horseback, and railroad train to speak for just three minutes. I've devoted a third of my lifetime to do the same, and I hope you'll remember me like you remember him. <laughs> 22 out of 50. 22 out of 50, just get that right on the Regents' multiple choice in history, and then put together three decent essays. No worries, you'll pass that history Regents. An assistant principal where I launched my 18-year career told me that. I should say that to students. It was a mandate, not a suggestion. She went around to us, to our department distributing lists of all the recycled history questions, your Treaty of Versailles and others. Then she came into classrooms to evaluate us and whether we were drilling those kids until they internalized it. God, they probably th thought about it at night. And it educates to mediocrity. Those aren't my words. Jules Henry, an anthropologist at Washington University, said that 10 years before I studied there in the 70s, but it's still true in much of our system. It makes fertile minds dull, it makes kids afraid, it makes them settle for just getting by, and it teaches them to temporarily memorize facts, but not to know how to analyze anything. You know, and I do, because I taught my last four years at Leaders that we can do much more and we already know how to do it. Performance assessment, I won't repeat what's been said in those generic definitions, but I will say, Fatima Grant, one of my students came back and said, Mr. Mike, my classmates freaked out in college when I was a freshman, when the professor's syllabus said 20 page paper, folks. I was nervous, but then I remembered, I did that already. 
Students not only do that, but in doing that, they teach us to track the evolution of their thinking, to monitor how they learn to persevere, to help them overcome obstacles, to form opinions, to write a scholarly paper, to learn the difference between a legitimate and illegitimate source citation, and to learn how not just to speak out in public, as I have the privilege to do, but how to debate it, how to respect but refute opposition, how to work out a consensus. Those are things that make great human beings but that's not what most of our system teaches. The system as a whole, and I respectfully say the testimony of the DOE representatives proved it, has Swiss cheese as a metaphor. There are pockets of visionary teaching, but that's not yet the reality. But as you've pointed out so well, and thank you for staying so late when so many of your colleagues have left, we know what to do, we know how to do it, and we know the impact it has, and so do the kids and their parents, and isn't that what lifelong learning and making democracy real is all about? Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Lori Gumminow, and I'm a retired New York City Department of Education special educator, special education adjunct instructor at Hunter College, and the parent of a student with disabilities. And for my spoken testimony, I'm going to focus on my role as a parent. Uh, my son received early intervention services from the age of six weeks due to his premature birth and special education services beginning at age three and continuing through high school. In the eighth grade, he refused standardized testing and did not participate in the PSAT or SAT in high school. He attended Edward R. Murrow High School in their screen theater studio, screen studio theater program, received set services or resource room, passed all of his courses, and earned the required 44 credits for a diploma. He earned a special theater award at his graduation in 2018. However, Due to math learning disability, he was not able to pass the algebra or geometry regions exam with a 65. He received a 56, a 55, and a 46. Yet he passed both of the courses. Um, my son also legitimately threatened suicide in the eighth grade when he couldn't understand his math homework. The big kitchen knife was in his hands, and I share this with his permission. As a result of not being able to pass a math regents exam with a score of 65, he received a local diploma. He also earned a special regents endorsement for theater, yet didn't receive it with his diploma because he didn't earn a regents diploma. Because of his failure, quote unquote, New York State deemed him not college ready based on their so-called standardized tests and regents exams. Let me rephrase that. He did not receive a regents diploma because of his score on one exam. A single test on a single day in a 15-year public school career determined that he was not college ready. There's something very, very wrong with that. This was the algebra regents exam that the year previously had been reworked to reflect the Common Core standards and had a 92% failure rate for students with disabilities. This was the year that students did not have the option of taking the old and the new exam and have the highest score count. And so, after all of the special education services of occupational and physical therapy, after all of the successful inclusion classrooms and team teaching, after all of the excellent professional development his teachers received, after all of the expenses of providing these supports and services, and most of all, after all of his dedication and hard work to pass all of his classes, he did not receive a Regents Diploma because of one test. And because he did not receive a Regents Diploma, he was not eligible to attend a public SUNY or CUNY four-year college. One test on one day out of the 2,700 days he attended New York City public schools was the deciding factor. This should have been a special education success story. There needs to be alternative and multiple measures of evaluating our students' progress toward graduation. All of the intense focus on testing and linking test scores to stringent graduation requirements is taking its toll on many of our students with mild disabilities. 
While my son worked very hard to pass his academic courses, his talents lie in the performing arts. He was a member of the Tada Youth Theater Resident Ensemble, a Drama Desk award-winning youth theater for seven years. He performed in nine musicals at Tada. This past July, he received a National Youth Arts Award for outstanding supporting performance in a musical for his performance in Tada's original musical, Geniuses. My son also performed in the Murrow production of A Few Good Men while in high school. Fortunately for my son, there is a happy ending. My son is currently a successful sophomore at Dean College in Franklin, Massachusetts. Dean is a test optional college, meaning they do not require SAT or ACT scores. They do require a high school diploma, and because they're in Massachusetts, do not care what type of diploma he earned. They don't care about scores on Regents exams. A high school diploma is a high school diploma. He loves being a college student. Dean provides excellent support services for him, including academic coaching and tutoring. And based on his college audition, my son receives a $20,000 a year scholarship for performing arts uh, and theater, and will be performing in a second college production next month while carrying a full load of 16 credits. He's not taking any remedial courses either. He is successful despite New York trying to beat him down and calling him a failure. And he'll be joining Anthony Ramos in a couple of years. You'll see him. All right. <laughs> I'm proud to call your son a fellow Murrow High School alum. Go Murrow. <laughs> All right, go Murrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Powerful stuff. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Rothman, and I'm the founder and executive director of Ascolta School Research and Design. We're a nonprofit organization. Works a lot of schools across the city. Most of the schools we work with are transfer schools, which are schools serving kids who had struggled in the past, been chronically absent in the past. Some of them are consortium schools. Some of them you've heard from today. Many of them are not. Um, and there are three points. I feel like you know, you've, you've already heard a lot of points today, and so my three points maybe are repeating some of the things you've heard, but I want to just note three things. The first is that uh, having worked with many city schools and with many offices of the Department of Education, the region's exams are often treated as if they're somehow sacred, I think. Um, and something that I've often said to principals is to not confuse precision with meaning. I think that because we have tests that can produce exact numbers, we treat them as if that means something, and sometimes it's hard to tell what they do. Um, I think also going with that is the thought that because they're designed by somebody who's outside of the schools, they're given more credence when, as we've been hearing today, that's often in many ways undermines their credence. The second point that I think is important to know uh, is that when there's a lot of studies out there from, I'll just go to employers, that say that what they need from students are not the skills that standardized tests assess, but they're actually the skills to problem solve, to collaborate, to adapt, that we were hearing in different ways uh, from consortium schools, uh, but that also are what employers look for. And there's this disconnect between what is assessed by the state and what they need. For the last 13 years, I've been working, as I said, with schools that serve this population of underserved students. Um, and I will note that the vast majority of those students are black and Latino students, often from low-income neighborhoods. They're students who have been bullied. They're students who are, who are earning the money for their family. They're students who face many, many hardships. And when you ask the ones who have succeeded despite those challenges, what skills they developed in their schools. They talk about the same ones that employers talk about, right? They talk about being able to adapt, becoming lifelong learners. They do not talk about the skills and knowledge that are on Regents exams. The third thing that I'll note that, again, we've been hearing today is that there, while assessing learning is important, there are other ways to do it there that are being used in schools in various ways. And as Anne had said before, the assessment system you create influences the culture of the schools that grow in the system. And so if we can think of new ways to assess and to support schools, we help foster different kinds of cultures in schools. Um, I, I feel like so much of what I sa I'm saying has already been said, so I won't say much more about that. Uh, the, uh, let me just see if I would add anything else. Um, 
I will, the, the one other thing that I will just note because it hasn't been noted as much today is that my sense of the regents being treated as sacred is that you take a test that hasn't in many ways changed much from what it looked like 50 years ago. And uh, right, there are changes, but in many ways it, it looks a lot the same. There was sort of this consolidation that we're gonna test math, science, social studies, we're gonna have these sets of multiple choice and open-ended questions. And in a time when now the, the way people access knowledge is so different in our society, that we are continuing to test knowledge as if we're in a place before internet and computers. And even though a lot of the things we talk about in consortium schools are the kind of thinking that I like to believe went on in ancient Greece, <laughs> it's also the kind of thinking that you need to be able to do to look at all this information that's thrown at us in our current society that kids need to be able to navigate. And helping them to have the skills to navigate that is something that we are not assessing at all in our schools. And we do a disservice to kids who have struggled and then experienced the anxiety of tests that actually don't matter for their futures. So hopefully we find ways to rethink that. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk and to bring people together to think about this. Thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Kamala Carmen, and I am a co-founder of NYC Opt Out, which is a no-budget, totally grassroots organization. Um, I'm also on the steering committee for New York, State, New York State Allies for Public Education, of which NYC Opt Out is a constituent member. Um, but as Lori said, I'm mostly going to be talking from my position as a parent of um, children in this system. So the email I received. Uh, about this hearing announced that it would be called Breaking Testing Culture. So one of the first things we might want to ask ourselves is what would our schools need to successfully break that culture? And fortunately, I don't have to think very hard to answer this question because both of my children have attended non-test-centric schools from pre-K all the way through high school. I realize that our family's experience is extremely rare in the public schools in New York City or even those of the state or the country as a whole. Um, but it also means that if we want to break testing culture, we don't have to scrabble about for some elusive key to solving this problem. We already have a handful of schools, including the consortium schools, but not limited to them, that serve as models. Uh, so how is it that these schools can have been liberated from testing culture when most schools have not? Uh, it's a combination of state regulation and parent voice, and the NYC DOE can, contrary to first impressions or whatever it said this earlier today, boosts both of these necessary prerequisites. Let's start with the state. So you've heard a lot about the consortium. My children from sixth grade on attended a consortium school. One is still there. Um, and as you heard that in lieu of the regents, uh, they conduct original research or analyses on topics of their choice. Um, the only thing I would add, I'm going to skip some of what I had written about that earlier, because the only thing I would add uh, to what was already said about that. Um, what this also do does is help children identify and connect their interests. So for example, my older daughter uh, did her history, you, you'll be able to tell that she has an interest in public health because she did her history uh, PBAT on um, government regulation of the op opioid is, uh, industry. She did her math PBAT using um, derivatives to, to calculate um, disease outbreak usually using actual data sets of vaccination rates in New York City public schools. She, um, she did her science uh, PBAT on 24-7 um, on exposure to Wi-Fi. Um, so doing all these things, you know, really helped her see the connection, interdisciplinary connections uh, between things. They're not like separate, like this is math and this is science. You know, she could make those connections. And um, this is a little mama bragging, but I, I will say that uh, my daughter won a first award in the New York City Science and Engineering Fair for the project that was based on her PBAT. And, you know, there are kids at all the specialized schools or whatever, she got a first. God, that went quick. So anyway, I want to get to the, to the next part. So uh, I wanted to say, while well, the state controls how many schools are in the consortium, um, as Council Member Traeger said, I might ask, what is the city doing to use its muscle, um, since we have the majority of the state students, to push for either expanding the consortium or in other ways securing Regents waivers for the city's students? 
Also, waivers only exist for the high school grades, in part because standardized testing in grades three through, three through eight is federally mandated. Here's where parent voice comes in. My children were able to attend elementary and middle schools that did zero test prep because the parents in those schools overwhelmingly rejected high stakes testing in favor of more holistic teacher created assessments. How did they do this? They opted out of the state tests. Are these parents just outliers? I would say no. They were able to organize because administrators at these schools did not try to hold them back. It seems that there are very few of these administrators. Why? Does the DOE punish or reward principals based on the test scores of their students? Are superintendents similarly incentivized or disincentivized regarding the test scores of the schools in their charge? At NYC Opt Out, the majority of the calls that come into our hotline are from parents saying that principals are trying to coerce them into taking the tests. They threaten summer school or grade retention. This is wrong, but not really that surprising. When NYC DOE, to the extent that it addresses opt out at all, I, I would c contest what um, Linda Chen said earlier today about the availability of opt out information, um, states that parents who want to opt out should meet with the principal. If opt out is a right, which the State Education Commissioner and the Chancellor of the Board of Regents have affirmed, why do parents need to meet with the principal, if not so that the principal can try to dissuade them from their purpose? People shouldn't need to ask permission to exercise what is an acknowledged right. A policy like meet the principal intimidates many parents, especially those who don't speak English or whose own experiences of school were traumatic or who merely can't come in during school hours. NYC DOE should emulate what some other school districts do, Backpack home a form where parents can simply check off, yes, my student will take this test, or no, my student will not take this assessment. And in closing, I just wanted to say, I also want to thank you for holding these hearings, but I'm also, I want to ask you, what can the city council actually really do, though, to push Dewey to do these things? Because do you, under mayoral control, they can do whatever they want. And it's, it's so disenfranchising as, as a parent to hear somebody who's an elected representative of the people, and you know, I've, I was at the, at the meeting where the, the council unanimously passed the Parents' Bill of Rights to have an opt-out provision in it and be, and, and be distributed yearly. That, that was in 2015. It's never happened because they don't have to abide by what the city council says. So that's... So I appreciate that. A couple things, uh, I actually, I think I was, I might have been the only member of the city council, I, I could be wrong, that testified at the state hearing uh, not to give the mayor full blanket power during mayoral, mayoral control. Uh, I believe in checks and balance. <laughs> and I believe that you know, parents, communities, local officials should have a, a, a way to shape, help shape our system. So also I will say that it was this city council, and I'm very proud of this committee in particular, that actually educated lawmakers about fair student funding because that was sort of like a, no one knew, leaders in New York State, I, I, don't, I don't want to embarrass some people, did not even know what fair student funding was, but made the charge that our budgets were not transparent in schools. And we had to, thanks to our great staff here in the city council, which is, which, which is extraordinary, we brought up to the state a copy of a school allocation memo to show them where they could find fair student funding. Uh, so, so here's your here's your transparency. Now pay us your CFE money. So we do we, we have a we have the ability to advocate to agitate. We have the ability to hold folks accountable. And I hear you. I was not one of the city officials that praised Albany on their budget. Uh, there was a net cut, twenty five million dollars to our school system, and that's with a blue wave. So there is still a lot of work to do up in Albany. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, we will continue to be a platform for uh, parents, for, for students, educators in our school communities. And the purpose today in breaking the testing culture, why I wanted to hear from consortium schools is because it's important that if, as you pointed out, if we're breaking something, what are we saying we're moving towards? What is the world beyond testing? And the fact that this world has been in existence for decades is really an indictment on the school system for not telling us about this and teaching me. I was a teacher during the time of consortium. Why did no, no one talk to me about this? Even in my teaching preparatory work, I would have loved to have learned 
about multiple ways, effective ways, to gauge proficiency and mastery of content. Even in my teacher training, it was test-driven. So it's a, an entire culture that extends both into our school system, even in the way we're preparing future teachers and school leaders. So I thank you, and we, we hear you. There's much more work to do, but we have shown the ability to make change here in the city council. Uh, and we have to hear, I'm sorry, my apologies, they're very patient <laughs> and extraordinary in New York City Civil, Civil Liberties Union. Please hear from Thank me. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for letting me join this panel. I'm actually at six o'clock have a, uh, another meeting I'm hosting on Gifted and Talented. So it's all a huge day about segregation and all of these things. So um, I won't take a ton of your time, but thank you so much. Uh, my name is Joanna Miller. I'm the director of the Education Policy Center at the New York Civil Liberties Union. Um, from our point of view, testing and the testing culture in New York City is an urgent civil rights issue. And we haven't heard it talked about very much today, um, so that's what I'm gonna focus on. Uh, the testing culture in New York City has created and fortified the deep segregation, racial segregation that we have in our system. And I think without, we, while ever, everyone's having conversation about segregation, and here you're having conversation about testing, and I think that those things have to come together if we're gonna talk about how this system tracks and segregates and separates children from the age of four uh, throughout their career. Um, I think we have to talk about how when the stakes are high, people who have the means will game the system. Um, there was a New York Times investigation a couple months ago that you know almost 50% of the kids who um, have extra time on the SHSAT are white and students who have extra time are far more likely to get an offer. I'm not saying those people are cheating, uh, but I'm saying when the stakes are high, people will find a way to get an edge. Um, and that's just the name of the game, right? That is, the, that's the whole game. Um, and I think we need to really be looking at those kinds of things. If anything, to me, that percentage actually just shows how arbitrary the time limit is at all and how arbitrary the test is at all. That just given a little extra time, you're gonna do that much better. Um, it doesn't change how much you know or how well you think, it's just given a little extra time. And I think that really just shows a lot of the arbitrariness in the system. Um, from the New York Civil Liberties Union point of view, we are very invested in school climate and culture that keeps kids engaged, that supports teachers in classroom management. Um, and you can't get that with testing, testing culture, and people have named that already. But I'll just say, um, in District 8 in the Bronx, the superintendent has started offering an enriched curriculum to every student, essentially a gifted and talented curriculum for every kid. And the curriculum was designed by an education professor, and she said that the primary tenets were engagement and enjoyment, because you can't do deep inquiry-based learning if you hate what you're doing and if you don't want to be in that classroom. And I think when we talk about the suspension crisis we have, um, when, when kids are dropping out because they can't pass tests, when kids can't sit in their seat, can't pay attention, and teachers don't know how to manage the classroom, uh, I don't see how that could be disconnected from a testing culture and from losing that inquiry-based learning. The last point I'll just make, and some people have mentioned it, but I just wanna put a finer point, is about narrowing of the curriculum. Um, at the Civil Liberties Union, we are super invested in kids getting adequate access to a lot of subjects that just aren't tested, to arts education, to uh, sex education, which we know is not getting taught because it isn't being tested, um, in a very perverse incentive. You know, Washington, D.C. actually created a standardized test for sex ed in order to ensure that they would teach it. So that just shows you where we've come. Um, and I think it's essential that kids are learning these things, civics, um, phys ed, arts, and that in fact, as you said, every kid has giftedness and every kid has needs, and a more individualized system that doesn't rely always on tests could allow us to meet those needs. And you could be super gifted in music and really need a boost in English, and that doesn't mean that you have to be segregated out and labeled into one bucket or the other. Um, so, I think I made my point. Thank you so much for letting me testify. Um, really appreciate it, and there's a lot more um, studious kind of sounding things in the written testimony. Uh, you're spot on, thank you, and I, I, I touched upon it, but you, you're right, we need to make the connection. This is about dismantling inequity in all forms in our school system, there, there's, there's no question about it. And I have received uh, so much, uh, first of all, a lot of support from educators and, and school communities, but I've also, there's critics out there that, that are just questioning like the PBATs and questioning the alternatives. I strongly encourage people to read 
like, you know, read the report from the SDAG, read the report, like, read about the PBAT. It's actually far more sophisticated than any regents exam. It's really meaningful. It's not watering down anything. I mentioned before about my memories of students memorizing dates and names in the Barron's Regents Review Book. That was painful. That's not learning. Or the flashcards that they would constantly create, you know, uh, Peter the Great's beard, westernization. I'm not sure if they could define westernization. Just, they just did a matching game just to memorize if they see a certain thing on a, on a, in the regions, that's, that's, the, that's not learning, folks. I know I'm singing to the choir here, but to the public, that's not learning. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate all of you, appreciate it so much. Uh, and the last panel, and patient and brave panel, uh, Tamara, Kate, Jennifer, uh, Susan, and Dermot. I'm good, thanks. Yeah, I know. I wasn't expecting to be here before today. I uh, emailed it earlier this morning. Let's give it to you. All right, so whenever folks are ready, you, you may begin. I'm happy to start. Hi, my name is Tamara Geyer, and I'm a parent of a fourth grader, and I want to talk about um, the standardized <laughs> tests in third to eighth grade, which um, haven't been discussed very widely today. Um, my son um, is not an English language learner. He doesn't have any IEP. He is maybe what you would call the classical general education kid. And I have to say that my first encounter with the effects of standardized testing actually happened when he was in kindergarten. Kindergarten, as I experienced it as a child, was that year of play where they introduce you to the classroom, they introduce you to socialization. In my son's case, what they were pounding over and over was this necessity to learn how to read. Over and over, learn how to read and learn how to write. There was no time for play and all these kind of things in a school which really claims not to do very much test prep in a year where they're still very far away from testing. So this was really, really sad for me because I remember my kindergarten teacher and I still love her. She's my sort of shining star. Um, and my child was not ready to learn how to read. The next year in first grade, about three months in, when he was ready, he learned it in about 10 minutes. By the time he got to third grade, uh, the year for testing, he was way above um, whatever the expectation for that year is, but if you asked him, he would still say that he hated reading because of the way it was drilled into him in kindergarten. Um, he's a kid who in second grade, you'd ask him what he wants to learn that year, he'd say, I wanna learn division. By the middle of third grade, and I have to preface this by saying that in third grade we had a heartbreakingly amazing teacher, one of the many very, very dedicated and creative teachers who, you know, because of the way Common Core and, and testing is structured, really had very limited input into what she could vary in her classroom. So by the middle of third grade, he was already saying, I hate math. I looked around and saw many of his friends. He comes from a house which is, you know, basically like a lower middle class house, but he's very supported in education. Not all of his friends have that advantage. So if I looked at my kid and I heard him and some of his friends who run the gamut of New York City saying, school is jail, and they're only in third grade. These are eight and nine year olds. We're not even talking about some of the difficult situations we've heard about high school and middle school and all of those things. The effect of standardized testing starts from the first day of school. And if we're looking not only to create people with skills for the future, but just the basic thing of we want kids who find the joy in inquiry, because those will make happier and better individuals in the future, we are losing that on the first day of school. And that is way before they get to the regions or any of this kind of stuff. So um, that's mostly what I wanted to say. Um, so thank you very much for allowing that opportunity. 
Hi, my name is Susan Horowitz. I'm the supervising attorney of the Education Law Project at the Legal Aid Society Civil Practice. But today I want to talk to you as a parent, as several of us have done. Um, I have two boys, now young men, 18 and 20 years old, with vastly different high school experiences. The 18-year-old went to Eastside Community High School, amazing 6 through 12 PBAT school. I'm not going to say anything else about that because it's all been said already, incredible experience for him, um, but just numbers-wise, by the time he finished 12th grade, he had done, I counted, between 50 and 60 round tables or PBAT style presentations of work. He's now a freshman at Temple University and he said the other day, mom, my history class is just like Ben's class last year. So really phenomenal, I love the whole program. But what to me, and, and I sort of talked about him because he always gets left out in our family because my other son who's 20 um, is really smart, really, really learning disabled, and from the time he walked into a schoolhouse for pre-K, we knew this kid is, he's, he's, he shouldn't have to go to school. Um, he uh, is, he has been in public, private special ed, non-public, and now back to high school, and is now at 20, finishing the last few credits of, um, of what's required for high school diploma. Um, he, what we haven't heard about much today is the new superintendent determination option that, thank the Lord above, the New York State Regents adopted because my son was not going to get a high school diploma. He is severely, severely learning disabled in all areas, but if you need somebody to come over and, you know, rearrange your furniture, fix stuff in your house, um, get you on to, uh, you know, a boat ride somewhere. Um, he, he is this incredibly resourceful. His superpower is networking um, and sort of understanding social situations. And to think about the fact that because of his learning disabilities, he wasn't going to be able to get a high school diploma, it was just devastating for us. You know, and he's the kid who at the Harbor School has volunteered for every activity, has done so many work-based learning internships that he maxed out and they couldn't give him another one. Um, I really wanted him to come with me today, uh, but he was busy working on one of the charter sailboats as a deckhand. All he wants to do is work. Everybody doesn't want to go to college. I totally appreciate that when we look at how schools perform, the focus is 90% of the time on, on um, high school acceptance rates, um, sorry, on college acceptance rates and on college readiness. I have a kid who has zero interest, nor does he need to have any interest in going to college, which is a lot to be said for the kid of a lawyer and a, you know, a guy with an engineering degree. But we have to remember that as much as, as, as we all have become very anti sort of technical track training, if my son had had the option when he started high school of just sticking with, even, even middle school, of like going toward this non-regions and more technical program, I will tell you we would have saved two years of him being out of school because of major mental health stuff that was in great part due to knowing that he couldn't do what the other kids were doing. And so what I really urge you is to, to remember that there is this huge population of kids, kids with and without disabilities, who don't have access to the kind of um, program that we've been lucky enough to find for him, <clears throat> excuse me, to find for him, um, and to open up this option of CEDOS, um, local diploma, um, superintendent's determination for kids who just want to get out there and work. And incidentally, he's going to have a much easier time finding a job than my college kid is going to have. So thank you again for holding this hearing. Hi, I'm Jennifer Gabore. Uh, I am also a parent uh, of a um, child who just entered pre-K, but I'm not here to talk to you about him. I'm here to talk to you because I teach at Hunter College. And I'm here to talk to you about um, uh, the students that I see in front of me and how they've been prepared or not to be in college. Um, I teach in the departments of gender studies and in political science. Um, 
So um, I want to just reflect for a moment, uh, Council Member Trigger, on what you just said about the ways in which you, your own teaching preparation um, was sort of test driven. One of the things I think about when I reflect upon um, the teaching or the, the things that we've heard today um, is that what we know, many of us know in the room, is that the preponderance of evidence and research on on you know, high stakes standardized testing shows us that we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. Right? and that there's this massive gap between all of that research right, and the ways in which we are learning. And luckily, one of the things that I do know about Hunter School of Ed is that we are not teaching teachers currently, for the most part, to do that. But then what we have is teachers having this kind of like melancholy where <laughs> they, in fact, learn particular kinds of things about pedagogy, but then go into school and don't get to practice them. And that right, is one of the problems. If I had more time, and right, this is not a hearing focused on higher ed, I would talk about things like um, um, student achievement and the issues tied to the GRE um, or other things. Among the different things that I think is under focus on in some of the hearings um, material that I've heard today <coughs> is the problems and limitations with the AP exam. And I would want to see that sort of like lifted up in some of the modes of analysis here because it is a terrible test. It is, it, all of the tests are really terrible and the pedagogy that comes and follows from those tests are terrible. College professors wish that we had time machines on a regular basis and we could go back and fix the things in the past, right? What we see are fragmented modes of knowledge. We see things that are identified in the literature as lower level learning and that researchers identify those things as coming from high stakes testing. We see students um, who are, we see students struggle with argumentation, with, with higher level modes of analysis, with collaborative and extemporaneous work, and with verbal participation, right? The things that would make them successful as college students that they are not being prepared for in regimes of high stakes testing. Um, they are taught to identify, regurgitate, toss away those knowledge, that knowledge rather than internalize those things as concepts. Right? That's, those are the things that high stakes testing right, emphasizes. Um, students do not have that kind of relationship to knowledge assimilation. And having taught bef both before third through eighth grade testing came in, and now seeing students come in who have been part of third through eighth grade testing, I can tell you that I see that difference. We have to trust teachers, right? When we talk about the, one of the things that hasn't gotten raised today that I just want to say, I am a teacher who gets to have extraordinary freedom in assessment and gets to do rigorous assessment. The, one of the things that really, really bothers me when parents say, well, what choice do we have? I have to be able to know how my students are doing. As if there are not modes of assessment that everyone agrees are here, right, are more rigorous and that we are failing to communicate, right, that those are more rigorous forms of assessment, better modes of assessment, rather than the, the fake modes of assessment uh, that we currently have, but that part of what it means is trusting teachers, supporting teachers to do that work, and that's what we have to do. Next, sir. Chairman Traeger and all city council members, um, members of the audience. My name is Dermot Myrie. I am an educator. I'm a certified school counselor and also a chapter leader. As a member of the movement of rank and file educators, the social justice caucus of the UFT, the time is right to end high stakes testing, period. It must be stated that our caucus has been at the forefront for years as allies of the opt out movement, numerous social justice grassroots movements, and people of good moral conscience educating parents, communities about the evils of high stakes testing. The demands of testing have placed so many stress, stressors on our teachers, students, and their families. Students are labeled bad. Students are labeled failing because of low test scores. Schools were closed are being truncated because of low test scores. Personally, I have been at PEP meetings for many years fighting um, former Chancellor Carina, uh, Farina, um, trying to make a difference, trying to make the argument that test fail our students, but finally we have a listener in you. Chairman Traeger, with you being an educator and lawmaker, it makes a difference. We have crossed paths so many times on the social justice trails in New York City, and I hope this is the one that will elevate the voice of students. Students do not even have a voice in a conversation about testing, which is really sad. Middle elementary school students, 
the length of time they have to be spending doing these testing, it's too stressing. Psychologically, there is research that shows that overtesting affects students' self-esteem when they fail, and it takes years to reverse this psychological harm. So I'm here today to speak as that role as um, social justice advocate. I must say my colleague, confident and um, Lieutenant Gubernatorial Green Party candidate and a member of Moore GLE. Um, she has testified before Congress about the if effects of high stakes testing. And I urge you to watch this testimony and enter it into the record as well. In 2015, she um, testified in front of Congress about the effects, the harm done to her students and students across New York City and around the country. And I also encourage you, um, Chairman, to enter the transcript in the record. The video speaks for me and for thousands of colleagues in, around the country. In closing, there is so much to say, but I must reiterate that high-stakes testing is profit-driven. It demeans children who have had a bad test day. It does not take into account that black and brown students especially are victims of systemic oppression and racist motives in a testing frenzy to elevate the haves, those who can have the money to pay for test prep in these test pits test prep factories, and then you blame the have-nots. I join with my ally, Professor Chen Yit Hayes from Lehman College, and declare that we end testing, um, using of artificial intelligence to have our students do the part test, and invest in teacher-driven authentic assessments for students. So I will just close by saying, just run the testing corporations and the consultants out of town. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Professor, just a quick question. Uh, First of all, thank you for your great testimony. And I'm not a professor, I'm a teacher. No, no, I, I know, and I, and I appreciate your testimony. I'm just, I'm just asking the professor a quick question from Hunter College. Uh, the, um, I, I have some concerns as well about how they're administering the AP exams. If you could share, just to kind of go deeper on your concerns with the AP exam, I'm curious to kind of share notes. Sure. Um, I, in fact, have been wanting to, I had tried to convince one of my colleagues here who teaches U.S. history to come. Um, he feels that he has described uh, the AP history test as having scorched his field. And I have wanted to, um, <laughs> I have wanted to write an op-ed with him. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the things I think about a lot is, um, for example, in the way that I was describing um, students' relationships to concepts, teaching like political science and I teach, um, I teach anti-discrimination work is one of the things I do. Um, I find, for example, that students do not know or cannot remember when the U.S. Civil War is. And these are students who, and I sometimes will sort of assess who has taken the AP history exam. Um, and so I have students who have gotten a four or a five on the test and do not, cannot tell me when the Civil War happened. Um, and that is because of that sort of disposability. Those same students can sometimes explain to me what hegemony is and a critique of hegemony. Um, so <laughs> part of what that shows, right, I mean, I think you understand what that means, right, about knowledge and learning um, and about the flaws of, and I, I mean, I remember from my own experience, right, in my own AP history test, of, test of, er, class a very long time ago, having my own AP history teacher tell me if it were my child, I would not be having, right, my child sit in this class because I love history, right, and I don't want this for you because I love history. And then I remember the feeling of going to college and having a history class and being like, oh, okay, I get it now. Um, and I, I mean, I love history also, right? I think you do too. <laughs> you know, you're spot on. Um, just my quick uh, re reflection on this is that before I left teaching to, to uh, serve in the city council, um, they had asked me to uh, start working on curriculum for an AP government course. And I just immediately r realized and recognized that it's not like magic that happens in there. They just give you a bunch of stuff to read and they tell you to read it very fast and they move on very quickly. And there's no time to just unpack and debrief and have, as uh, Ann Cook mentioned, a discussion to kind of discuss concepts, like big ideas. How does this connect to the real world? It's just, here's a bunch of text, read it fast, move on, and move, next. That is not learning. That is not learning. Especially if we have students 
I'll, I'll close this hearing also by, by sharing a personal story from, from my teaching days. I had a student in 12th grade who, uh, 7.30 in the morning class, it's tough, um, I had assigned a, a government uh, assignment. They had to respond to Washington's farewell address. And it was common core aligned, all, all, the, all the good rubric stuff. But um, a student come, shared with me, Mr. Traeger, I, uh, you know, I'm going to try, but I, I'd rather not do this assignment. Can I instead bake you a loaf of bread? <laughs> that was a fascinating request, one that I did not expect. Uh, and, and I said to him, well, um, I'm always open to trying bread, but uh, why don't you give me a draft? I, I'll work with you on this. And he really did not want to do the assignment. And I kind of found out that he also would sometimes come in late uh, to, to, to the class, very tired. Um, I, find, I found out that he uh, was working at a bakery overnight, one of those bakeries that have nighttime hours because they do uh, delivery routes to restaurants and diners around the city. And he would, he would work there to support his single mom and younger siblings. And he would come to school, but he would come to school very tired and late. And... Uh, he brought in some of the bread that he baked, actually, and I have to tell as someone who likes to cook when I have time at home, it was some of the best, if not the best, I've ever had in my life. And this is a child that we also labeled as, as underperforming, as struggling. Um, he was extraordinary. Um, the question I asked myself is that how was a student able to uh, go through all these years to get to the 12th grade and have difficulty, for example, forming like a, a thesis statement or topic sentences in an essay. Like, when did the system kind of stop and say, wait a minute, let's help assist the child? Um, and, um, and how do we miss out on all the amazing talents that he does have? So that's what kind of sh drives me as well, in addition to what I observed. Um, even with folks pushing for gifted and talented, look, every child in my view has gifts and talents. There's no magical curriculum there either, folks. It's not like some magical fairy dust sprinkles in the class. It's just they give you a, a lot of stuff to read, move fast pace, move on to the next. We have to ask ourselves, I think I, I could speak for folks in this room, but does the system, does the DOE actually value learning? And we have to really keep emphasizing that question. Do Obviously they value? not. Right, they don't value learning. And, and that's the fundamental issue here. There are other agendas and interests at play. And so I really thank all of you, the educators, and also, quick note, I'm a proud CUNY graduate. I love my CUNY experience. I love my professors who, who helped me with pedagogy. I wish I had more pedagogy, quite frankly, in college. Sometimes it was more content, but I am so grateful uh, to our professors, to educators, to our parents, to our school communities. You, you give me hope. Uh, that we will effectuate change, with, and, and, and I am with you every step of the way. And uh, I think we can close by just saying all of our children are extraordinary. Let's build a system around them. And thank you very much, and this hearing is adjourned.